Four sporty looking and sporty driving big SUV coupes. Which one is the best? In this video, we will take a look at exterior, interior, and the driving of the Mercedes GLE Coupe 53 AMG. the BMW X6 M50i, the Audi SQ8 and the Porsche Cayenne Turbo Coupe. These are the performance versions each, but not the highest horsepower spec ones. Above that there would be GLE 63, X6M, RS Q8 and the KN Turbo S. So here we focus on the already expensive, but not most expensive, already very powerful versions that still are supposed to give you some kind of a compromise between sportiness and comfort. Of course, this comparison also gives you an overview of the differences between these models in general, also when you take a different engine version. And after you have enjoyed this special episode in full length, tell us in the comments and in the poll which one is your favorite and why. Let's go! The Mercedes GLE Coupe and also as a special version the Mercedes AMG GLE 53 Coupe. So please join us for exterior interior and the driving experience. We will also compare GLE SUV to GLE Coupe and of course take a special focus here on the 53 AMG model. Everything as you know here on Autogefühl with Thomas and Jonas behind the camera in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go! Please subscribe to us if you haven't done so far and warm greetings to our long-term subscribers here from freezing but beautiful Austria at 2,000 meters or 6,500 feet height. And here the Mercedes GLE S Coupe, especially at the 53 AMG. Let's take a look at the front grille because when you think about a GLE SUV, the top part of the front grille is a little bit wider. We also see it in our overlay picture of the GLE SUV front grille, whereas the GLE Coupe or Coupe, we always say Coupe because we lean to the French original pronunciation. There's also a separate video about that. Then here the lower part is a little bit wider to make it look more aggressive. And also there are different front grids available, a standard one. Then there's an AMG line. We also have vehicles of those on location. My favorite front grille with this diamond pin grille. And then here the 53 AMG has those very massive vertical fins which make it even look more aggressive with the AMG badge as well. Also sensors are hidden behind the Mercedes logo. And also the 53 AMG gets bigger you know, areas right here in the lower part, 
really beautifully done, very sporty, but yet elegant. And the color for today is, yes, brilliant blue, one of the Thomas blue colors here from Mercedes. Headlamps start with LED, actually, with a beautiful daytime running light. And optional, you can get those multi-beam LED lights with the high beam range. And we also did some night shots for you, where we can see that it was really very well illuminating everything. And those multi-beam LED lights, they can also save some of the spots. For example, when you are behind a car, that actually those spots are left out, so you can drive with high beam on, yet not blinding anyone. We also have a white car here on location for the 53 AMG and also a selenite gray one. But definitely our brilliant blue <laughs> GLE 53 looks best here as contrast to the white snow. And the length here for this duration is 4 meters 94, 16 foot 2 or 194 inches. That's about 4 centimeters longer than the predecessor or 2 centimeters in wheelbase longer than the predecessor. But however, and that's interesting, the wheelbase here of the GLE Coupe is six centimeters or two and a half inches shorter than the one of the GLE SUV. BMW doesn't do that differentiation between the X5 and the X6. Mercedes actually affords to have this differentiation then because they say they want to make the coupe a little bit sportier as for the driving feeling. We'll soon find out if that's the case. Yeah, of course, as we have the AMG 53 today, it will of course be the case somewhat. No, just to <laughs> tell you that in advance. Wheels come actually in the GLE Coupe from 19 to 22 inch. The 53 AMG always features 20 inch. And optional, we got here 21 inch. Yeah, still somewhat of a compromise. I think 20 inch might be the best compromise between visual and also the comfort still. Here with winter tires, it looks a little bit smaller. With summer tires, those wheels would be looking even bigger. Then, of course, you know, the typical line right there for the coupe with this sharp ending here, strong shoulders. Over a very central design, definitely the big difference also to the SUV, which will be continuing right there. Here then with the chrome frames around the windows, that's also a nice contrast to the brilliant blue, definitely. And talking about suspensions already, you start with a normal steel suspension, optional the Airmatic air suspension, which is standard for the 53 AMG, but then in a special stiffer AMG setup. For the GLE Coupe, you can also get this e-active body control, which can also lean inside the corners. We tested that one with the GLE SUV already. But in general for the GLE Coupe, not for the AMG models, because the AMG models are set on a sportier tone and then exclusively feature an anti-roll control that the car does not lean into the corners, actually, yeah. Again, the e-active body control would lean to the inside of the corner, you know, to, you know, even out those G-force effect. And here the anti-roll stabilization keeps it just straight that you don't roll to the outside of the corner. Very interesting. And again, we would test that in the driving part. And you can check out different suspension settings from our different GLE reviews. We will also link them in the video description and in the pinned comments. The rear of these SUV coupes is always splitting opinions. Some love it, some hate it. What about you? Please tell me your opinion in the comments right there. Definitely in this new generation here because of those horizontally drawn tail lamps, also with a new LED signature, it looks a little bit more elegant. Then we have this integrated spoiler wing right there, AMG badge for the 53 model. And you can see those are beauty tips just on the outside. and. They are very beautiful fake exhaust, yes, but again, the real exhaust is on the inside. Then you have those different fake elements right there in this checkered structure. And this was a very cool aluminum style contrast and together with the strong diffuser here then for the AMG model. So what's your take? And of course here when flipping the logo, then you can open the trunk, which we will take a look at in the interior part. So what do we have here under the hood? A 3-liter 6-cylinder with 435 horsepower, acceleration figure 5.3 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, and of course a standard classic all-wheel drive with a rear-wheel bias and then of course a little bit adaptive. 
So pretty powerful, definitely for this 53 AMG version, and it will also be, you know, quite significant as a petrol engine overall. Because, first of all, for the GLE Coupe, there won't be the entry two-liter four-cylinder engines as for the GLE SUV. So both not diesel or petrol. You will definitely start then with the three-liter six-cylinder, both on the petrol and diesel side. You will have a GLE Coupe 450 or 450 with a 3 liter 6 liter 367 horsepower, but not in all markets. For example, probably not for Europe or Germany, rather US and Russia and so on, for example. So you will have to check your market specifications there. Then here the GLE 53, as I said, and then there will be the GLE 63 AMG, 4 liter V8 bi-turbo with 571 or 612 horsepower in the S version. 4 or 3.8 seconds is the acceleration figure there. And then you'll have the 350D, 3.6-cylinder diesel, 272 horsepower, or the 400D, 330 horsepower. And then there will be the PHEV section, plug-in hybrids, either as a 350DE. This one is then is mated to the 2.0-liter 4-cylinder engine diesel with 320 horsepower overall output and a 31-kilowatt-hour battery 100 kilometers or 60 miles of range and the same battery will be put in the petrol PHEV which will also be available for the coupe again with a 2 liter 4 cylinder then mated to the same electric powertrain so very interesting as for the engines so let me sum up again no small entry engines for the coupe both petrol or diesel but you only get those then with the PHEV combination will be very interesting we drove the DE diesel p have in the GLE SUV already you can also check out that review and I'm really looking forward to the p have as petrol that could be a very important engine also worldwide and if you also think about like taxation benefits and so on and you know locally emission free and since the petrol engine will not be available as 450 overall on whole world this one here the 53 can also be actually a quite significant petrol engine because the AMG share for the coupe is bigger than it would be for the SUV, at least for the predecessor, and Mercedes also calculates with that here for this all new generation. This is the car key, slim and light, also with the AMG badge here, of course, in this case, and a matte black finish. Mm, yeah, quite fancy, I like that. Keyless entry, it's like when you put your hand on the outside right there to shut it, and then on the inside to open it again. Door closing sound. Hmm, that sounds solid, really cool. Do we also have soft close here? No, it's not in there, but I prefer a better closing sound. Soft close, of course, always an option. Then, inside of the doors, with the Artico leather red cover, pretty high class. Then we have a carbon fiber inlet here for a sporty look. Burmes sound system with a really good sound indeed. Here, seat heating, seat cooling, and also the gentleman's function. When you press this one, then everything you do here is for the other seat. When you want your boyfriend or your girlfriend, depending on who's driving, to have, like, you know, the seat heating is um, you know, not powered at the moment, but it's a pretty cool function, definitely. And reasonable door pockets right there. Then we have AMG entry badges and AMG floor mats here in the 53 version. Next to, oh, this like, oh, with winter tires, please only drive to 40 kilometers. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I would remove it anyway because it destroys this nice carbon fiber once again. Then soon more to the screens and so on. We have the AMG steering wheel which comes with a flat bottom and some nice microfiber dynamica on the side to have a better grip. The Distronic here in this new gen generation adaptive cruise control goes to the steering wheel. It's a little bit easier then. Then for the left thumb a button, for the right thumb as well on the other side to control the screens. Seats always come with sport seats in a GLE Coupe and would be standard a full article, sustainable leather red cover in the AMG 
53 or then also an AMG lines, you get inside then usually with Dynamica microfiber like we see here, but for the whole inner seating area and outside articular the red. Again, Mercedes offers a wide variety of animal friendly choices also for the coupe and also for the sports version. Just in this case, it's the full animal skin pack with some Alcantara. So let's get inside right here. It's a fairly easy entry. Of course, the AMG sits a little bit lower as for suspension and so on, but it's still decently comfortable. There's no panoramic roof in this car here, this very car, but you can actually get one. Then there's headroom check, still some left with 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1. And you know it's really up, upright, comfortable seating position. Here the GLE Coupe has a flatter A pillar, so you have a little bit less room. Yeah, with the GLE SUV you would have a more open feeling then, but still at a good level. Then the steering wheel can be moved up and down and also inward and outward, electric way. And it offers you really great grip. And by the way, here the um, Dynamica is really good with and without gloves. So this works very well then in, in this case. And you'll also have some special gauges here for the AMG models. We'll take you on a tour of the screens very soon. And one more thing I already want to show you right now here when I power up the car, here on the left side of the steering wheel. So you can change the suspension settings, for example, but you can also change what you want to see in there and pressing this one here. So, so many things to do there or here, for example, um, the exhaust note you can change then. So change what you want to change with pressing on the screen and here then for the rest. Yeah, the quality has been improved meanwhile of those additional gauges but still I think they do not fit to the rest of the interior so much and on the right side here this turning wheel like we know from Porsche for example to change the driving modes of the car and when you click on it um, this one does not do anything in this case other than switching back to the eye to the individual mode so turning for changing and then always clicking to the individual mode that would be your mode so to say yeah and then zoom more details to the screens there definitely comfortable that doesn't change here with the coupe but again a little bit less room you have available and the seats of course you change from the inside of the doors right there and again yeah always with this nice gentleman's function it's also like a differentiation from the glc to gle now the interior and let's start with a fancy thing you know here the integration of the ambient light is one of the coolest here in the GLE and the GLE Coupe and of course you can also change the colors and it's not only right there, also other parts of the interior, you know, inside of the doors and also, um, yeah, oh yeah, Jonas shows you that right there, inside of the doors for example at the co-driver side, that looks pretty cool, we can also change some more colors and also at those handles, um, you know, in the lower middle console, we can show that later, so uh, pretty cool but I stick definitely with one of the blue tones. The general overview is here with the big air vents, that's the same GLE Coupe and the GLE SUV, overall the same, then 12.3 inch standard, two times for those screens, horizontal layout. Yes, the steering wheel is blocking something of that, um, depending on the position. Then again, the controls here, home screen and then right thumb to control the screen, but also with touch or with the lower trackpad, that's possible, so really redundant controls. On the left side then you can control those digital instruments, soon more details to those. And again, those gauges for the performance ones here, you know, with the driving modes, also from this perspective. Overall, very sensual design, definitely. And if we move on over a little bit to the lower side here, for the temperature controls, this one is a nice clicking sound for hotter and colder and I like to have that one separated still. Then Payen and Lecker on the lower middle console being used, you can slide this one open then to have an, either an inductive charging pad for your phone but I always have it with a cable anyway so there's you know, to USB-C twice, once for connection, once for charging only because the Apple CarPlay and Android Auto they work over the cable only here at Mercedes. Then cup holders, they are adaptive and can also be cooled and heated. Then there's the mentioned middle trackpad where you can also write something on for example. Then the driving modes, also talk a little bit more about the driving modes when we drive the car very soon. And some other hotkeys for example on the other side for the GPS map. This is just to rest your hand and we have the air suspension in here that means you can raise it or lower it also here but it's also automatically done 
depending on the speed you drive and also on the driving modes or we can activate the exhaust right there. Last but not least there is this middle armrest where you can slide it open in this known split way like this and some more space underneath with more USB-C charging. So a little bit more details here to the infotainment system. It's a very nice and decent visualization. Comfort, you go seating comfort for example, you can activate those seat connects and they're moving always a little bit while driving, just a little bit to um, you know, give you less fatigue, but you could also opt for that one here with the massage functions, really cool. They have single dots in the seat, which are then controlled, so it's a pretty amazing function, definitely. Then you can also set your AMG right for the racetrack, but those performance gauges are more handy because then, for example, you can um, you know, check the engine function. If I turn it on, then you can see I can rev it up. Brum, brum. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, while it's charging, it started as well. You can see that all, that also working. The GPS right there. Nice visualization in Austria for you here today. Sometimes, of course, you know, a lot of stuff has been loaded right there. Well, yeah, it was a little bit getting loud from the vents. And what else in settings? You can see here, change the ambient lighting as I was doing that earlier. Quick access here, for example, to activate or deactivate the head-up display. But you can also do it with the voice activation or then, for example, and I put the engine on for that as well. Hey, Mercedes. Hey, Mercedes. How can I help? I'm cold. I'm increasing the temperature on the driver's side to 22.5 degrees. So like that, or you can say like, drive me to Berlin for the GPS. For the GPS inputs, of, of course, one of the most, uh, you know, you know, you know, the best features to use for that. And Apple CarPlay integration, not all over the screen, but usually they don't have this widescreen format. Looks like this. And as for the music, um, it's actually quite good. So, wow. It's a nice surround sound. This Burmese sound system, one of the best there is. Crystal clear and always enjoyable to listen to that. And here you can always jump back to the Mercedes menu too. Digital instruments. This one is the AMG Super Sport View with revs on the right side, for example. Jonas can rev it up if he likes. Yeah, way to go. Brum, brum. <laughs> so you can have this view, um, but you can always change what you want to see exactly. For example, what you want to see in the middle part, what you want to see on the right part. You can, for example, also have then a GPS input right here. See, like this. So this would be possible. Or a view how the driving details are changing depending also on the drive mode you pick. Then you can see here how that one changes. But you can also change the whole view of the system. So this would be super sport, but you can also get just to sport. If you're not super sporty, but just sporty, for example, then put a little bit more classic, then you can pick again what you want to see in the middle and also on the right gauge. So it has the um, yeah, GeForce meter in the middle and pretty flexible with that. Or you just go with a very classic view like this and have it there. Understate is also possible that we know from the normal Mercedes models too. But this one here, the so-called classic view. Here we go with the head-up display and well, that's also a special AMG gauge where you have this big RPM meter right there. But of course, a normal speed also and some other information if you like. Does it look like it's pretty cold here? It actually is. <laughs> so let, let's make ourselves comfortable in the rear. First of all, you also have a nice article leather that covers the inside of the doors, also with the carbon fiber shoe tab, not to bring the snow in there. And the cool thing is, in this new generation of the GLE Coupe, you have more legroom. This is the seat as I would be driving. And you see, you still have plenty of legroom. So, because the wheelbase has been increased, if you compare it predecessor GLE Coupe to this one here. But then if you compare GLE SUV now to GLE Coupe now, as we are in here, you have a little bit less wheelbase again, SUV Coupe comparison. But still, you see, this is actually still totally decent so for four toy adults it's no problem at all headroom wise this also works i mean it's of course li just like this like a hand over my head when i lean my head backwards it still works so there's hardly any big compromise of course the suv then offers more headroom and there's one thing they changed here the seat bench is a little bit lower so it falls even more backwards and 
it's still very comfortable here yes but that's like the cost of comfort that's what you pay for that you know so um it goes back like this so you are sitting more comfortably in the suv in the rear it's the same also bmw x5 versus x6 that's also more comfortable in the rear than in the x5 so yeah at some point they wanted to keep the headroom and so they had this decision then in the middle part by the way it is also okay for short journeys it's not too stiff on the middle part here so you can also sit here with three adults that would actually work then we have isofix at the outside seats we also have the nice alcantara inserts here but again stick rather with the base version or the base seats you have then with all the dynamica microfiber this will also be then cooler in summer and not that cold in winter like it is now so that's the adaptive cup holders at the middle armrest and we do flip the seats if we want already from here and a two-third one-third split other than that it's also possible to use just the mid since we are in the skiing region here here just the ski hatch the middle part and then there's also this rear climate unit so when the car is powered we see you know some additional features right there and usb c devices two more in the rear so what about the luggage compartment? Is there any big compromise here? Let's find out. You can also have this foot cook, foot cook, cook, <laughs> foot kick opening mechanism like this. There was the proof. And then the only thing I'm not really, you know, happy with, you know, this, this top cover. I mean, it's the solution here for the SUV coupes, but still don't like this solution somehow. I'm not sure if there's any better solution for that. So, and then here, actually quite wide dimensions you are limited here then in the back part with the height it would be continuing with the suv like this but below the cover it's actually not a problem you can see here easy fitting you know so much luggage in here and i can also remove that for you piece by piece don't even have to play any tetris so here we go and this is then a clear view of what we have available in the gle coupe you can see you can use it for everyday driving the leader figures would be in comparison 825 for the suv and 655 for the coupe and the maximum leader figures 2055 for the suv and 1790 for the coupe so you lose about you know two to three hundred liters each but again you know you can get along with that very well so what about the measurements <laughs> yeah there we go so the length is more than one meter 10 so one meter 13. the width here is more than a meter so like almost one meter 10 and the height up to the cover is 44 centimeters that's still decent and the overall height in the very middle is about you know is more than seven like 75 centimeters on the sides then it's a little bit less this one would be more than 66 centimeters right there but still you know actually quite well usable so what else this one here is a 12 volt power supply this one here is to lower the car actually a little bit with the air suspension and then yeah that's also then a big difference we cannot flip the seats from here so we have to go around and like this and then you always have to check if the front seat is actually put to the front but when we have a very tall cameraman this might not always be the case isn't it jonas <laughs> so that's like this and when i now measure to the front seat i can you know almost put the two meter uh in there of course still the seat is not all the way in the front and that's also with the other side that you can get a full access right here so that's then the full loading capacity and you can see here to the seat as i would be driving that's then almost the, again the two meters so pretty well well usable you can also remove this top cover there and last but not least if you look underneath right there lots more space and you can of course then also fit a replacement tire if you order that option Well guys, let's start with some sporty driving. Whoa, <laughs> that was 0 to 90 kilometers an hour. Pretty powerful and there you can see already what this AMG beast <laughs> is capable of. And we don't need a V8 for that. So sports mode here, the exhaust note is also tuned up. And wow, 
pretty beautiful tunnel in here so very scenic road also for you guys wow hard on the gas we have to be a little bit careful definitely i go back to the sports but not sports plus so they we still have some esc left so we shouldn't exaggerate that also when the road is a little bit wet like it is at the moment but definitely you feel the pure sportiness of this vehicle first of all that the coupe is a little bit sportier than the suv feels like you know a smaller vehicle definitely and then of course this amg setup we have here this not only changes the power that would be one thing we have driven you know the the base engine of this one before definitely beast here <laughs> in the engine performance but also as for the other setup you know the air suspension is really laid out very stiff and also the front axle this is an important point for the steering precision so they have a different front axle here on the 53 amg version and so it is for once a little bit stiffer than from the front again but also a little bit more precise as for the steering so the more direct input is guaranteed and this is again a thing of you want a sportier then go for this one you want more comfort then maybe go for the most powerful non-amg version but you know you can pick that for yourself and feel here that the input is really really precise see it here it's, it's it's a slalom like effect as you would have maybe with a with a sports car also that's pretty cool so now for whatever reason speed is being reduced here but that means and later on it's also being taken away and I mean driving slowly with this vehicle feels like standing still because the noise insulation is so well done yeah you hear something from the exhaust definitely you can also change it here individually also the powerful and you also hear something more of the exhaust sound even when you're just now at a slight acceleration so I have to be a little bit careful right here and then when the speed is being drawn like set free again like a couple of meters we can accelerate once again exhaust set to powerful and from 50 kilometers blop, and that's 100 so you already heard that the car was shifting back first so it's not about the turbo lag it's more about the shifting lag so to say how can you not have that well use the shifting pedals on your own oh wow great ambient lighting here also in the tunnel so shifting pedals here very crisp you even hear them clicking and then you can shift back yourself first and then immediately accelerate and of course it's a little bit more fun to use the shifting pedals on your own and you can also induce a little bit more of that sound here we go blop also when you're shifting up you can hear a little bit better in the tunnel of course noise installation isn't that well done that don't hear so much then that's the thing then also with modern cars so they're so well insulated that that's also the reason why they do those artificial sounds on the interiors that you can still hear actually what's going on because everything is so well insulated for soundproof reasons you know like wind noise and so on and that's actually also a good thing definitely so how you like the AMG 53 here so far you want directly to start with more <laughs> agile driving because here in Austria it's really hard to find so many agile driving spots definitely yeah it's definitely a lot of fun so we can say Coupe is a little bit sport a little bit more fun to drive than with the SUV even more so in the AMG so the AMG trim definitely fits to that definitely um, however then the question is if you want more comfort then you would not go with the AMG trim or then again with the SUV if you want more loading space in the back don't feel totally different but again you know when you have SUV normal trim versus coupe in an AMG trim that is then quite a quite a difference because you have like sportier plus sportier you know with coupe plus AMG so this is then really a difference you feel noticeably and you don't have the feeling that you would be driving in a big SUV because handling and suspension wise and that it's not rolling and so on this rather feels like a smaller sportier vehicle 
also one of the reasons they put the entire roll stabilization here for those AMG models exclusively. So the GLE, GLE Coupe, they do not offer rear axle steering. They do offer this special e-active body control, you know, where the car can lean inside the corner. But here for the AMG models, they, they thought, let's do exclusively this, A, this AMG roll stabilization. So the car keeps more upright on the road, keeps more straight. And that is also playing an effect because, I mean, no matter what I do with the car here, it does not have like this SUV rolling effect because it sits higher and so on. This one here, the AMG version also sits a little bit lower. And again, stiffer air suspension where it don't feel anymore it's an air suspension together with the anti-roll stabilization then makes this SU typical SUV feeling or like a soft air carpet ride feeling that just diminishes. And when we're here uphill and have the powerful exhaust on shift back again and then yeah really refined also this um, this engine definitely and at the end of the conclusion you know I'll test some different um, uh, surroundings of course when you giving it a go here on the throttle the fuel economy is ridiculous mm. but even before that I did some you know resettings and then keeping it straight and was still ending up with you know very very high fuel fuel consumption like about 12 liters and one kilometers I'll check out if I can bring it down somehow on a straight road but we had some good result with the normal 3D six cylinder in the GLE SUV with about 9 liters on one kilometers and it's about 26 mpg US 31 mpg UK that would be cool but here in the AMG trim although it's the same base block it seems to be definitely a couple of liters higher just because of the different tune even if you keep it rather steadier you know and when the road is you know a little bit uneven here mm, yeah from time to time you get the feeling mm. yeah it's cool and sporty fun but then again do I want to lose the comfort that this car usually gives you yeah so I'm just mentioning that you know that you can decide then for yourself it's definitely a lot of fun to drive this year and yeah so precise um, so agile doesn't remind us of a, of a big SUV. I think that's, you know, that's one of the cool things they wanted to achieve and actually they did also achieve that. So that's about, you know, sporty and agile features and so on. But what about like a normal city driving, a little bit more traffic and so on. Let's hop to the city with the relaxed driving lounge. You know, you have this upright seating position, still this SUV character, although it's here the Coupe. So it's still a very comfortable car. Yes, just in the 53, 53 trim, you have to be aware of that, that you do lose some comfort on the cost of more sportiness, but that's probably exactly what you want when driving this vehicle. There is also this new MF system here. It's a mild hybrid that we also see like EQ power and charge. So there's recuperation happening when I'm off the throttle. And we also get something of an electric boost. And recently also had it in the Mercedes GLC and also the same in the C-Class MF. So that the Mercedes systems here, they are not necessarily saving so much fuel, but they're giving you more boost, for example. They're saving fuel on paper, but is it also in reality fuel saving? We'll also keep you updated with the fuel economy figure later on. Driving through Innsbruck here at the moment, by the way, a beautiful also here with the river that goes all the way through with this deep green color because of the sediments that are carried over from the Alps when the river is running down. So, but here from city driving, I mean, yeah, you're a little bit limited as for the view with the Coupe when you look to the rear. Um, you know, have to bear that in mind. Then, however, you do have blind spot monitors, for example, um, you know, the triangles and flash when someone is trying to overtake you. So that's definitely very helpful. Other than that, it's still a very comfortable car and you can also get along in the city. It's easy to maneuver, easy to steer around and so on. I always like to look at that, you know, at the brilliant blue color 
definitely <laughs> even through the side mirrors so as for the steering input the AMGs are a little bit stiffer also from the steering and I like that because sometimes the base Mercedes steerings are a little bit too soft to me they still feel natural they don't have dead areas or something but here in the AMG it definitely feels a little bit more direct and, uh, and a little sportier oh now here over this construction site hole well yeah there you feel that it gets really rough then with this one so I think if we have to go left here Seems like the like the blind spot monitor was act, uh, you know was, was deactivated, was it? I'm not sure about that. So we can also check it. Is it, is it set to, to English, by the way, this GPS? Yeah, it looks like. So we can say, "Hey Mercedes." Hey Mercedes. Huh? Oh, that was like so. I can also um either say "Hey Mercedes" or then the button here. Activate blind spot monitor. I'm sorry. Can you say that again, please? Activate the blind spot monitor. And I don't know where I should go. I think left, probably. Yeah, left. So with the head-up display, it works. When I, when I say, hey, Mercedes, and then um, activate head-up display, but maybe it doesn't get blind spot monitor. Or maybe it has a different brand name at Mercedes or something. That could also be. So let me go on left and head on to the motorway. Just a little bit, we can get, get it to a little bit more speed. Oh, what's the police doing there? Roadblock or something? Oh, the GPS also said that the road was blocked, but now it's not blocked anymore. Hmm. In this case, we can also go to the sports mode and just give you uh, at least some, you know, acceleration here just when you just hit the throttle once. That's already 30 to 60, like just pressing the throttle once and you're directly there. Of course, I have to reduce the speed here to 50. And I can also set the cruise control here, left side of the steering wheel. So it's really practical now that there's not this separate column anymore. You just set it here with the left thumb and then the distance to the car in front of you is being kept actually. So uh, and it's actually pretty reliable. They also have those updates for the lane keeping assist and yesterday um, as I was driving the GLC I was testing also that it's now actually respects the emergency lane so when you're on the motorway and you're on a left lane and it's getting traffic or traffic jam even then it's not in the middle of the lane the cars but it moves to the left there's still the emergency lane left that's a very useful feature definitely pretty interesting you know at about 70 kilometers an hour or like you know, 45 miles per hour still very very silent the whole car the noise insulation is really um, extremely good this Alcantara inside ceiling is probably also even dampening that hardly anyone ever mentioned that that interior materials if you have for, for example more fabric or more Alcantara will also have a good effect on the noise insulation of the car because just like you know when you think about like a room in a house when you have some curtains or some uh, sofa in it that you also have less echo for that. So definitely also a very, very interesting aspect as for that. So overall, very calm, neutral, balanced handling feeling with this car. Yet again, you do feel the AMG setup. And also if you compare the Coupe versus the SUV, they don't feel like completely different vehicles. However, here with six centimeters less or two and a half inches, almost two and a half inches less in wheelbase, there's a slight difference you feel. It feels a little bit smaller and it is actually a little bit smaller than as for the wheelway. So this is noticeable and I was really wondering that Mercedes takes this, you know, this extra cost they have by having two different wheelbases. And but they obviously really wanted a differentiation between the SUV and the coupe. The other competitors do not do that. But I think it is actually noticeable. So, um, yeah, why not to give the customer a little bit more sportiness than where that if they can actually um, you know, afford that. You know, by the way, traffic jam function we can um, also test out if I set the cruise control. And let's see what the car does. 
So I also see then you know which speed the car is set to. And what, while you know while doing that, you can also browse the menu like this, for example, with the lower touchpad. I can also use the thumb here and see that head-up display is activated. What's that? Oh, that's the the car wash mode, when you know all um, windows are being shut shut off and so on. This would be ah, it's like entry mode, lowering lowering the car. So assistance systems. Let's see. Attention assist, active blind spot assist. Ah, it's actually oh, active lane change assist is also available. Let's also activate that. So. I haven't seen the blind spot on the flashing yet, but that might also be, uh, you know, due to speed or something. One thing this car does not al already have is a capacitive steering wheel, so it does realize if you're at the steering wheel, if you're now like turning it and not by, you know, touching it. So there can be some false positives when you're just running straight over time. And here you see in this traffic jam, the car is just rolling. It is also keeping its lane, but you should keep your hands on the steering wheel all the time. Here in this case, you know, just for demonstration purposes, uh, but you see that it's keeping the lane definitely also steering with you. And then after a while, yeah, like now, the car complains, keep your hands on the steering wheel again. And now to our conclusion for today with the Mercedes GLE Coupe. And of course, the special focus here on the GLE 53 AMG also as coupe well first of all to the difference gle suv and gle coupe of course it's the design this falling roof line then we have the little bit shorter wheelbase which makes this one here in the driving experience a little bit more agile still you have plenty of legroom in the rear and also headroom is okay a little bit less comfortable on the rear bench than in the suv and of course limited in height than in the trunk However, still very well usable. And of course, the difference when you take a GLE SUV and then to the GLE Coupe as a 53 version, it's even bigger because here in the AMG 53 is of course even sportier, especially from the suspension. You have to know that you will lose comfort with this very stiff air suspension they put in here. So if you want this comfortable air carpet ride, then you should not go for the 53 AMG model, but rather for one of the non-AMG models. And always take a look at the wheel size. So when you go a little bit smaller, then you also have a little bit more comfort. Then you can actually vary if you want it sportier or if you want it more comfortable. Overall, a very convincing ride as for the sportiness, especially here with the anti-roll control they have in the AMG model. It does not roll at all. It does not really drive like a big SUV. It rather drives a little bit sports car-like as far as the overall weight goes, of course. So a very, very convincing, agile driving part we had here, especially in this very model. What engines are there to look out for as well? Of course, the plug-in hybrid variants. I'm really looking forward to the petrol PHEV. That one will probably be both for the GLE SUV and the Coupe, one of the engines to go for. So we will also keep you updated with those. Now looking forward to your feedback in general. Would you pick the SUV GLE or the Coupe? And would you go here for the AMG or for one of the other ones? Please leave out the comments and also let's discuss this car even further. This is the all-new generation of the BMW X6 today in our full driving review. And it comes directly for you as M50i. So this review is a story about SUV coupés and illuminated double kidneys. Here on Autogefuel with Thomas in Full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go. That's, oh, that was already 110.
please subscribe if you haven't done so far. And here, the all-new BMW X6, it has a different double kidney than the X5, actually, so a little bit different from the form. And if you compare it to the predecessor X6, this one here, even stronger in the front. And of course, this new three-dimensional look of the double kidney. Closed fins here at the moment on the inside, they open on demand, so this is more efficient than that they just open when the additional airflow is needed. As the M50i, it has also a stronger lower bumper and those air intake style here in the lower part, so really aggressive. Riverside Blue is the color for today. Yeah, a nice Thomas Blue, as we call, strong blue tones here on Auto Gefühl. Then those headlamps are now more horizontally oriented, LED as a standard, optional adaptive LED, and those ones are the optional, optional laser lights. 500 meters of high beam range, these in Europe, in US, it's a little bit restricted for you know half of the high beam range due to regulations, but you still get those blue accentuations. That's, you know, some guys all just go for those because it looks quite cool, but it's also extra in price, of course. Yeah, and then about this very special feature, at the moment, because in the front side, um, it's nice to see the daytime running lights right here, like they are, but there's also this illuminated front double kidney, and why is it shut off at the moment? Well, when the daytime running light is on, that doesn't work, sadly. But it's also a reason, or that's the explanation, how they could make this legal. The first point is, when you have a direct light source, like an illuminated Mercedes star, it's allowed in some US states and others not. That is not allowed in Europe, for example. So they had to, A, put an indirect lighting, so the light is on the inside and doesn't shine to the outside, but to the inside of the grill. And the second reason is, they could actually allow it or use this so-called homologation because they said it belongs to one of the headlight units. And then, you know, <laughs> the different countries say, yeah, okay, then we allow that. And so that means that the illuminated front double kidney only works when the real light is on, not only the daytime running light, but the real main headlamp unit is on. Then also the middle part is on and also allowed while driving. 4 meters 93, 16 foot 2 or 195 inches is the length of the X6. It's the same as for the X5, so also the same wheelbase. Whereas Mercedes differentiates the wheelbase between GLE and GLE Coupe, they go for the same wheelbase right there. And that means also they have the same features and somewhat the same driving dynamics. However, the X6 is set up a little bit sportier as for the suspension. Suspension starts with an adaptive suspension directly, then there's an adaptive M suspension with a little bit stiffer setup, and then option you can also go for the air suspension. And also this one here directly gets the rear differential lock, the M50i. And what you can also get is the rear axle steering. They call it integral active steering in here now with BMW, that it also includes this rear axle steering feature to reduce the turning circle and to make it a little bit more agile at slower speeds and give more stability than at higher speeds so it goes at lower speeds in the opposite direction than the front wheels and at higher speeds in the same direction as the front wheels. Very interesting. And also the anti-tilt control, the anti-roll control that works a little bit against it in the corners. Also very interesting feature. But what about the design? This is the main thing about the X6. First of all, again, the Riverside blue color. Then the M50i gets those cerium gray contrasts here at the side mirrors, for example. The M batch from the, for the M performance models. Those ones here are 21-inch wheels. Not the biggest. There's also 22-inch wheels available. We soon show you an M performance parts car. And that one also solves a big problem because here the logo at the BMW wheels is not upright at the moment <laughs> with the 22 inch wheels you see there's in this um, you know special wheel where the logo always stays upright up to a speed of 80 kilometers an hour we'll soon reveal that secret to you then the rest of design here with the glossy black and the m50i and then of course the difference to the x5 we have this falling roof line it looks a little bit more elegant than before if you compare to the predecessor again comparison predecessor x6 a little bit longer, a little bit wider, but not too much dimension change. And very interesting also this black accentuation right here again and the very strong shoulders. And in this case also the wheel arches are painted in the vehicle color. What do you think? The rear is where the biggest design change happens here if you compare it to the outgoing model. Here, more horizontally drawn tail lamps and that makes the rear on the one hand, more elegant. On the other hand, it stresses the width also. Then this additional spoiler appear in the vehicle color. M50i badge right there. And also this 
M Performance model gets the gray contrast in the lower part together with the vehicle color diffuser style. And those are beauty exhaust tips on the outside, the rear ones on the inside, and four exhaust pipes actually here for this V8 model. And what's also interesting, talked about the air suspension earlier, you can either go four centimeters up or four centimeters down, depending on the driving situation. Four centimeters up, of course, off-road. And indeed, also for the X6, they offer this off-road package. They also offer for the X5 because they said customers demanded it. If you want to take your X6 off-road, well, maybe not the hardest off-road situations, you know, but some B roads or whatever. So apart from a small engine for the Chinese market, the X6 worldwide is all about the three-liter six-cylinder engines and... In this case, also the 4.4 liter V8. So the M50i here, 4.4 liter V8, 530 horsepower, and just over four seconds, the acceleration figure, two one kilometers or 62 miles an hour. All wheel drive, of course, with the rear wheel biased is standard. As an alternative, there would also be the 40i, which is a three liter six cylinder petrol engine, 340 horsepower. The consumption difference will be about 3 liters on 100 kilometers or 10 mpg, so the 6 cylinder definitely more fuel saving. And then there's also a diesel side, especially for the European markets, either a 30D, that's in a 3 liter 6 cylinder, in this case then with 265 horsepower, and also the M50D, the strong diesel, same base engine, so to say, but a higher horsepower tune than with 400 horsepower. key you can also get the normal slim one uh, this one here the computer key i call it is also light so it's not heavy but of course a little bit thicker in your pocket then but there's one good advantage and for people like me sometimes i leave the car and say did i really close it i don't know i can't remember and here i can i can actually see it if it's closed or not and then you can also for example use the preconditioning if you have an independent heating in the car and so on so yeah also as a advantage but there's also keyless entry first of all to close the car you put your finger on here then it closes or the hand on the inside then it opens again door closing sound you're quite solid i've heard better ones but i've also heard worse ones then higher interior build quality if you compare it to the predecessor hofmeister king design element here for the door handles on the inside everything galvanized as for this part really cool then carbon fiber inlets here for the m50i you can also get different decor elements, of course, for the X6 in general. Reasonable door pockets also for bigger bottles. Then the M50i also gets those entry badges and also aluminum paddles. Next to a sportier M steering wheel, which can also be heated with a separated button on the steering wheel. And those seats here are also a sportier version. So for the X5, for example, you can also get other base seats. The X6 is already a little bit sporty in some elements. And sadly for the X6, only animal skin seats available so far. In the X5, you can also get the more sustainable and animal-friendly sensor tech material. I really love the combination as for the color. Just wish this one, this one was also available in SensorTech, but I would probably go for the BMW individual program and then order a SensorTech for me because... Obviously, it's possible, but I mean, this combination from the blue to the beige is just beautiful. You know, the color combination, that's really cool. Seats from the form is really comfortable. You have the upright seating position. It's not too different from the X5. Of course, the A pillar here is a little bit flatter. So in the X5, you have a little bit more open feeling here, sportier, somewhat more caged in feeling. But still, you get this elaborate high big suv driving feeling which is pretty cozy and pretty comfy then the steering wheel can be adjusted here with the electric support and you can find a good driving position and even if you're one minute 86 or six foot one as i am still some headroom left so for tall people no problem but again the x5 will be a little bit better as for this case but you go for the x5 because you want to have that sportier styling of course 
interior overview. Everything is very well organized, but also digitalized. Here we got the carbon fiber inlets and this digital cockpit is also standard 12.3 inch screens on both sides actually. Soon leads to those screens and also the other ones right there. First of all, the steering wheel again with the compact size, M's, uh, M form. Then on the right side, you can activate the voice activation with a button or also say, hello BMW. Drive me to Berlin. That would be one example. Okay. So for the GPS input, for example, that works very well. Some takes a while, if you know, depending on the web connection. But here you can see works pretty well. You can also change the temperature for that and also ask the car some things and you can just try it around and it's a good system, the best one at the moment, together with the MBUX of Mercedes. Then the rest of the steering wheel. On the left side you have the adaptive cruise control also with the highway mode. It can also change lanes by the way um, if it's allowed in your country to do that. The shifting pedals here also plus and minus or with the 8-speed automatic converter gearbox. Then if we go back to the middle part right here again zoom models to that screen. First of all the climate unit is still separate here you can control it while driving like this and also with AC on and off that's cool I like to be able to do that to shut off the AC sometimes if I like to not possible in the 3 series by the way but here it is the lower part with the metal knurled knob for the volume and some hotkeys you can set individually then this carbon fiber middle part I'm not sure about this folding process not too happy about that all the time but that looks cool when it's closed when it's open we have the inductive charging pad for your smartphone. It makes sense because you have the wireless Apple CarPlay, no Android Auto yet. And there's a USB-A charger, 12 volt power supply, adaptive cup holders, and they can be, if you have that option, heated or cooled. You can also see it then with the color what's happening at the moment. So that's definitely pretty fancy. We also have this crystal gear shifting lever for this very vehicle here together with the knob turning and pressing and you can also write uh, letters of an address if you like so driving modes we'll talk about that when we drive the car here you can also see that we do not have the air suspension in this very vehicle today but the adaptive suspension otherwise we could also adjust the air suspension right here if you have an x6 with an air suspension and then the middle armrest right there splits open like this and then there's a USB-C charger and with some reasonable space. Yeah, here we go. The BMW wings as a top light. I still love that feature. <laughs> and also cool, a frameless back mirror. Elegant, but also gives you a good view. Of course, in the X6, the view to the rear is somewhat limited. Infotainment system detail right there. So, whoa. Yeah, that takes some processing power, but if you're closer up, then also it's more responsive. Good GPS direction, routing here as well. You always have the hotkeys to be able to go back to the main menu. Phone connection, either Bluetooth or then with the Apple CarPlay wireless. That, that time it also connected quite fastly and the sound system built in here is also quite cool. So we have the nice surround sound. I like that. This one here, the top sound system that's available, the Harman Kardon sound system, you can see it here at the inside top speaker, delivers you a very nice sound and you can always play around with the sound settings as well. Where would that be? Here at car settings, general settings, sound, here Logic 7 sound and you can, for example, I always boost the surround sound that, you know, just is... A little bit cooler then. <laughs> so, and the Apple CarPlay integration, by the way, if we go to the main menu, see here, it goes all over the screen. That's also well done like that. Very, very crystal clear. You can see everything very well and always can go back to the BMW menu. And what's also cool with the car settings right there, if you go to driving information, you have the sport settings, you have the G-forces and so on. That's possible. Or the X view where you can see you know, how the car leans and also have the compass in the middle. Those digital instruments give you a good overview of what's happening and also the M50i gets a special badge in there. And yeah, we also have a blue car as a visualization, so that is very fitting. And if we turn on the car, you can see everything. Yeah, the steering wheel also moves down. That's also a comfort feature and comes towards you a little bit. Left side speed, right side RPMs. And if you have a route set, you can also see there's a map on the inside. 
That's again also the reason why they made the RPMs counterclockwise, so they have more spacing on the inside for the... Yeah, Jonas likes to rev it up, man. <laughs> so overall, I think a very cool instrument right there. Not as flexible as the ones that Audi is offering. You have more, you know, situations where you can flip it around or change the view, but actually this is all you need. So I can also understand the decision just to leave it like this because you don't have the urge to change anything there. Head-up display is a good option always with the speed, allowed speed and also some GPS directions. At the moment we only see an arrow, but when you approach the next intersection you will also see a more sophisticated visualization of the next intersection. Now to the rear compartment, which is very interesting. First of all, also soft materials at the inside of the doors right here. Nice design, same as in the front. And you can already see, yeah, there's not <laughs> abundance of space. I mean, there's a little bit more room than in the previous generation, yes. However, if you consider the length of the vehicle on the outside, then the space you have on the inside, it's of course somewhat limited. And the big question is also, what about the roof line? What does it do? And I mean, the bench here is falling backwards a little bit. That ensures you to have some more headroom left. I always say that falling backwards benches are not that comfortable, that's what I experienced. So you can also see that, you know, here the space then in, uh, under my legs. So I don't like, like, like it that much, I found it more comfortable in the X5. Legroom wise, it still works somewhat, yes, but again the package is bad. So we have cars that are way shorter and have more interior space, but it still works for four tall adults. Even headroom is no problem because they adjusted you know, somewhat of the rear bench. But again, if you want most comfort, go for the X5. But at least they did some measures to ensure a head and legroom still also in the X6. So you can drive it here. You know, it, it feels a little bit weird sitting that low in the rear bench, definitely. But you can also use it for child seats with the isofix on the outsides each. Then you have this middle armrest right there with a cubby hole and some cup holders to flip out and they are also you know a little bit adaptive you can also use this ski hatch just if you want to yeah like this <laughs> you just want to use the middle part here for your skiers but you can also flip the seats directly from here in a two-third one-third split that's possible and of course a middle tunnel but since this car is an suv and sits high the step here is somewhat limited so you have an additional ac unit if you like so of course again an option also with seat heating but that's again also an option some cubby hole right there 12 volt power supply in the lower part oh cool both heated seats at the moment yeah it's quite cold still outside this morning then in the middle part you can also sit it's a little bit you know stiff in the middle part but it still works also for you know shorter ways than also with a third adult in the rear. To open the rear hatch you can either use the button in the lower part, you can click on the key, you can click on the inside of the door in the driver's part, but you can also use the foot kick opening mechanism like this with a short kick. Here we go. And then it opens and yeah you're of course a little bit limited if you compare it to the normal SUV form. You have this little bit <laughs> weird folding mechanism here for the top cover. In width it's all the same, in length as well, it's just the height right here, but the boot volume is also measured below the cover and that means they don't differ that much. Here in the X6, 580 to 1525 liters, whereas the X5 has 645 to 1860 liters. So that's in the first liter figure only a difference of 140 liters and again the reason is that it's measured below here and then the difference is not too big. So right here with all oh, with hydraulic struts here, this additional cubby hole, you can also have a replacement tire if you want one. But this one also quite handy for some, you know, whatever you want to store right there. Pretty interesting. And if we take some measurements now for you, the normal length here is more than a meter, one meter and five, as well as the width is, well, here in the very front, more than one meter twenty. And if we go into the inside right there, it's even here, more than a meter, so even almost one meter and ten. That's that's really pretty decent. And the height right here, again, this one is not the biggest difference. 
below the cover. This is 44, 43 centimeters. Just the very top part is limited then if you compare it to the X5. You can actually also flip the seats from here and they directly fold flat. You can see it also on the other side and this is a very handy function, definitely. And this looks actually quite decent. So for most things you can use also the X6 very well. Um, I would think about when I put my mountain bike with d mount front tire and then the handlebars are standing upright or something, then the X5 would be, you know, better. Um, but other than that, for most other cases, there won't be too much difference. And this one is almost 1 meters 90 in length then to the seat as I would be driving. What about the child safety test when I use this one here? Hmm, that's pretty sensitive, so very well done. Up and <laughs> down again. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge with the M50i here of the all-new X6 and we can put it to sport mode and yeah, don't have to care about that or have to worry about that. The engine is already warm. We've driven like a lot of kilometers already, so it's no problem to also put the shifting stick to the manual shifting box and then also go to the track or sport traction mode, dynamic traction control activated. And uh, then we can, you know, really also floor this engine out. Um, this will be pretty amazing. And you can also listen to the V8 sound. So let's go. And that's oh, that was already 110. Whew. Whoa! <laughs> and I was was not even starting in a straight line. I had to like steer a little bit. You maybe have seen that. And this all-wheel drive brought all the traction to the ground. And yeah, great sound from the V8 engine. Wow! So very impressive acceleration. And yeah, that must have been somewhat four seconds. So um, wow! So the X6 a little bit sportier in the orientation as the X5. Also, we do not have the air suspension in here. There's the adaptive M suspension. You know, this car standardly comes with the adaptive suspension and makes the car a little bit sportier and the air suspension more like a carpet ride. But the air suspension, both for X5 and the X6, is laid out in a quite sporty way, definitely. In any case, if you are in a sport mode, you have more feedback from the road. So this feels really stiff now, together with the anti-roll control or anti-tilt control. This really keeps the car upright. So although we're in the big high seating SUV, I mean, if I do induce some slalom here, you, you will surely see that already on camera. The car just keeps straight. It does not lean anywhere. So that's really amazing and astonishing for a car of that size of, of that segment. So um, yeah, that really feels sporty and the car feels, feels smaller and sportier than it actually is segment or uh, vehicle type wise so yeah wow that's really amazing steering wise also a good feeling um, again I would need some you know a little bit more feedback from the low degree angle input so but it's actually it's quite okay and then you get um, nice feedback when you go a little bit further so that's actually cool and in any case very sporty wow and this V8 growling, this is of course a difference than to a six cylinder, so definitely better sound, but fuel consumption will be higher. And I mean, the other engines that are available are also quite powerful, so you don't need to go for the V8, of course, also really high in the entry price, that's another thing. Then, if you go to the comfort mode again, sound gets a little bit more silent. Suspension gets a little bit more comfortable and you can also cruise through the city Put back the shifting lever that we also don't turn up the RPMs that high So the shifting characteristics are also changed in this manual mode You um, you, know, you rather want to use the shifting pedals, of course You've seen with the launch control that the car also does shift itself. It just keeps it, you know, longer in the individual gears but here then a little bit more silent right there. We also don't want to wake up all the neighbors here when we are in the village. 
the outside we can tune it up more just a little bit then and so this car can actually still do both that's what i like with the m performance models that you still have sportiness and comfort at the very same time in here now even if you're on the comfort mode you know just maybe shift back two gears here with the shifting pedals oh maybe the car shifts back another gear itself <laughs> once more very interesting um light and you know surrounding here now also with this morning fog we have pretty spectacular so yeah definitely something to enjoy here for you we are just outside of munich near the bmw headquarters as well and i'm really enjoying this countryside drive here with the bmw x6 it is definitely more agile than the previous generation maybe he even like an m performance model of this generation can keep up with the true M model of the X6 of the previous generation. So more agility, more stiffness in the chassis, at the same time better noise insulation and of course more power here also for the M performance model and the true M model will get the same engine just with a different horsepower tune and will of course be more aggressive but here we already feel the rear wheel bias from this permanent all-wheel drive which is doing a great job. And again the difference between X6 and the X5. This one does feel somewhat sporty, especially in the M50i trim, but it's not that you would feel, oh, those are two so incredibly different cars. You do feel the resemblance, but then the question is, you know, what do you want uh, design focus-wise on the exterior? And so uh, if you want a little bit more, you know, spice in, in the driving, mm, yeah, it's just def definitely a matter of preference. What I really like is um, with the X5 that you more have an open travel feeling when you are when you are driving. Definitely this one here a little bit more sport here caged in, but that's also you know some prefer that, others prefer the, the other thing. So definitely great what they did here with the suspension. Um, although I usually tend to like it in a normal base setup because it gives you a little bit more comfort. But here then, if you want the M50i with the and the X6, then probably is also a good choice to make it a little bit stiffier, stiff up, um, just to you know serve the needs of, of the of the customers that go exactly for that. And here also noise insulation wise, you can prove it again at 100 kilometers or 60 miles an hour. Stays perfectly silent in here. The only thing that you can then hear is this uh, V8 engine. That's probably also how it's supposed to be. So now back to 80 kilometers. The brakes are also you know, really aggressive. That's pretty cool. 21 inch wheels still work. I would not go for 22 inch wheels. That's a little bit too much. And also you lose comfort. We experienced that recently in the M50D from the X7 as well. I would rather go with maybe even 20 inch wheels. Just have more dampening from the tires themselves. And then it's also not that bad when suspension is maybe a little bit stiffer so rather go for smaller wheels yeah i know the bigger ones look cooler mm, but the smaller wheels just give you a little bit more comfort and they're just better in everyday driving life also if you think about damaging some wheels or something um, that definitely also makes makes a difference now this v8 growling is it's always pretty nice. <laughs> Definitely can can live with that. Although, um, especially when you're driving on European roads, like the 40i will definitely be enough. And it will also be the most important engine worldwide. This one here, definitely, if you can and want, want to spend more money on that and also want to spend more time at the fuel station. So soon we also head on to the motorway for some everyday driving situations. And I also talk more about the everyday driving life uh, fuel economy. Uh, what I also, also want to do is um, do just a you know, short turnaround to show you like how you know how flexible this car still is somewhat. Also we can show you something of the camera systems. Um, because I mean it's not a small car, but still when you use the camera systems and also this rear axle steering, um, then you are somewhat still flexible because the turning circle is reduced, so I can also you know turn the car around right here. Um, you don't exactly see it with your own eyes how the rear wheels are turning but you somehow feel it that especially in the low speed areas the car is definitely more agile like here there you for example feel it so it 
fakes a smaller wheelbase, so to say. Then you can always go back to the sports mode and you can see how it accelerates when it's already at speed. Here, for example, again, 50 kilometers to 100. Plop, and that's already it. That was 107 already, wow. And you see that the car really like, yeah, there's an anti tilt control right and left, but just from this pure acceleration, the car leans backwards then when it accelerates, like <laughs> That's always definitely uh, funny to experience. And I'll use the next right turn also to show again how stable the car uh, stays in the corner, actually. And the corner speeds that are possible with this big SUV are also amazing. Look at that, you know, and wow. A little bit rubbing the tire to the ground, but see how upright the car went there. That's really amazing. So, um, big and heavy SUV, but it feels so sporty. That's actually what they wanted to achieve, and indeed they could. And that has also been you know, further enhanced with this generation. So, pretty impressed with that, definitely. So much fun also to accelerate out of the corners here in those winding countryside corners. Oh, this T6 bus is also some quite some speed right there so this is one of the rare SUVs rare big SUVs where you can still have a lot of driving fun just on the countryside routes and you can definitely compare it you know with the um, with the Porsche Cayenne um, driving dynamic wise this is what I think would probably come closest to it you know Audi Q8 is also doing quite well also in the driving dynamics and comfort um, uh, you know combination and so on um, we also have videos of those cars, of course. You should check them out. So always good to compare some of the competitors, definitely. That's, that's always always fun to do that. So definitely great fun driving experience here with the all-new X6. And of course, throughout this, let's say, model history, uh, this, um, this new generation, we'll also keep you updated with more engine versions, if you like. This guy is already saying, like, we better leave those guys by. <laughs> now uphill. Wow. Oh, birds, pay attention. Wow, and this great tour here through the morning fog. I hope you really enjoy that together with me. Quite spectacular atmosphere just for you. <laughs> And again, great job here from the adaptive suspension, even though we are in the sport mode, not really missing any comfort. Wow. So what do you think here for our sporty part? Now to some calmer driving parts here on the motorway at 120 kilometers an hour cruise control and the minimum absolute minimum consumption you can score is some 10 liters on 100 kilometers if you have cruise control at 100 or 120 kilometers an hour set or like 60 to 70 miles per hour set and that's then you know like 25 mpg or something but the usual more realistic fuel consumption would be like at least 12 liters more kilometers so a low 20 mpg or 23 mpg uk that is rather realistic and that's not even with exaggerating it and using all the power so this v8 definitely higher in the fuel consumption than the six liner as i also told you earlier here the blind spot monitor you can see uh, the yellow triangle is flashing that's definitely a good option to go for aeb autonomous emergency brake is a standard equipment this more sophisticated acc adaptive cruise control is also an option but you can get those driving assistant packages for example and there's also this assisted or this highway pilot mode and there the car is being kept in the lane yeah if i there it is keep your hands on the steering wheel at all times so Please don't repeat the demonstrations I do here. Just want to show you that it works actually. And what's also now working again, even in Europe, it was forbidden for quite some time because of the regulations. Now it's allowed again. Here when I hold the turning indicator and then the car is doing the lane shift itself. So I was not doing that. I was just holding onto the steering wheel. So um, yeah, if that's that necessary and useful, that's maybe on another sheet of paper. 
I don't know. I mean, you can say why not. It's also like more again a transition to autonomous driving. But if I just leave the car doing that, or if I turn the steering wheel a little bit myself, yeah, I'm not sure if there's a big difference for that. What is cool, definitely, that you can also drive this engine in a calm way, and it's really very silent and sophisticated, confident, and you. I mean, noise insulation is really cool, so. I don't have to raise my voice here that much. It's also improved if you compare it to the previous generation. So a very great, relaxed and silent ride. And of course, anytime you want, you can also <laughs> rev it up and then have even more power available when they ride again with the shifting pedals, with the sports driving mode and so on. But here in the comfort mode, also just fine. And the suspension is also good for a relaxing ride, definitely. The Normal adaptive suspensions at BMW are so great that you do not need an air suspension necessarily. Um, here in this adaptive M suspension mode, I mean, it's a little bit stiffer than the normal adaptive suspension, yes, so you lose some comfort to some extent. Then it feels a little bit sportier, as I told you earlier, but you can still live with that very well. So. Probably if I would take an, like an X5 or an X6, I can all very well imagine just sticking with a normal adaptive suspension that has a good compromise between comf comfort and sportiness. And then you don't have to go for the expensive air suspension. And don't, especially when you keep the car for a longer time and think about like long term maintenance and so on, then the normal adaptive suspension will be cheaper on the long run. So that's maybe also something you might want to take into consideration. So also feeling very well here with the car just cruising and that's not too big of a difference to the X5. Yeah, the X5, as I told you earlier, leaves a little bit more room, a little bit more travel feeling. And this one here always, especially with this visual impression it does, a little bit more aggressiveness. And then the M50i here with the adaptive M suspension, also a little bit more sporty spice, but you know, small nuances, definitely. Yeah, I mean, and that you can say about all X6 and X5 models, they're also, even if they're in the sporty tune, very, very good travel cars. And a short excursion how you can make your X6 a little bit more, well, even more aggressive like this with the M performance parts. So you can basically make yourself an X6M, but just on the visual base. For example, you can see it here already in the front with those carbon fiber double kidneys right there. And also in the lower part, Riverside Blue is the color right here. Yeah, we could call it also Thomas Blue, a very beautiful, very bright one. And there are more features throughout the vehicle. Here in the side profile, glossy black elements also here around the windows. Then we have this black inlet here with the M Performance logo. And right there, 22 inch wheels, really massive. Also with some very nice details. For example, also here, the, you know, the, the valve caps right there with an M logo, painted wheel arches, an M logo. And this is actually an M50D, but again, as I said, this is almost as the X6M will look like. What do you think? And in the rear, there's an additional carbon fiber lip right there, then black X6 logo, carbon fiber lower diffuser, so really massive. Yeah, those ones are the outer beauty tips, the real exhaust pipes are on the inside here in this M50D. So what do you think? Is it too aggressive for you or would it be exactly your pick? By the way, you also realized I changed outfit because we filmed this part here at another day. And there are more special things to those wheels, not only the red brake cable calipers, which are great in contrast, but also here, the logo, the BMW logo, you can see it right here. <laughs> you can play with that all day. And yeah, one of the major problems when owning a car is of course that the logo would not be upright when you stand still and park the car. So this problem is finally solved. You maybe know it from Rolls Royce <laughs> that the logo stays upright. And it's really interesting. We can take a look at it not only here, but also we have a tire right there. First of all, from the front, separate tire and like this <laughs> so funny and even if I'm rolling the tire now you can see it stays upright like this really funny and if I turn around 
like this, you can see how it works. Here the lower part has a weight and the upper part is empty and therefore it's always staying then like this. So today I'm training for the vegan strongman with my colleague Patrick Baboumian. Best greetings to him. Wow, those 22 inch wheels, they are really, really heavy. And a short look at the interior, which is mainly dominated by carbon fiber in this M Performance look. Instead of the doors or also next to the steering wheel. Oh, yes, the floor mats, even more important, M Performance floor mats. How could I live without them? <laughs> and well, at the steering wheel, you also have carbon fiber inlets. And also, if you look behind that, the shifting pads right there, the pedals, they also have carbon fiber. But even more, you can see it, of course, at the steering wheel. And the most use of carbon fiber is at the middle console, lower middle console, around the shifting lever, right there. And, well, I think that's actually quite cool, because then you have less high-gloss black in the interior, and actually, I hardly see any anymore. So, yeah, carbon fiber style, not, not, not too bad, actually. And back here for our conclusion for today with the all-new BMW X6. In the exterior, it is a little bit sportier and more elegant than the previous generation, so I think that works very well. Interior, step up the build quality, and of course, we know it already from the X5, that isn't too different. Really a very lovely interior. Sadly, unlike with the X5, no animal skin alternatives yet. At least BMW promised that they're working on that, and also, of course, for future models, but still a disappointment right here. Then the interior space, I mean, it's more or less the same also with the X5, just that the trunk space, you can live with that, no problem. You lose a little bit in height than if you want to transport something which is really high, then the X5 is actually better for you. This one then, if you prefer this sportier styling. Driving-wise, also somewhat similar to the X5, of course, this one set out from the you know, basic setup, a little bit sportier, you do feel it, and of course, as the M50i, this is the most powerful, the most fun engine you can get so far. Yes, there will also be the X5M and the X6M, which will be the most powerful then from the real M lineup. This one here, the M Performance model, so the most powerful from the normal lineup from the X5 and the X6. Definitely a lot of fun. Well, you know, yeah, this eight-cylinder always has also a high fuel consumption, so that's no doubt, um, have to live with that. My pick would actually be the 6 and the petrol engine, both for the X5 and the X6. Or thinking about even the PHEV model, this could be a very clever choice. This one here, if you really want this V8 sound and if you, you know, want to spend more money also on fuel. But definitely a great acceleration, a lot of fun when you really floor this car out. Let's show you a Porsche Cayenne Turbo Coupe. And we will also show you the direct comparison Cayenne SUV and the Cayenne Coupe. What's the difference in full HD, full screen, and full length? Let's go. Let's go.
In the front of the Porsche Cayenne Coupe just looks the same as a normal Porsche Cayenne SUV. The turbo, of course, with a little stronger air intakes here, especially in the lower area. This color here is called Mahagoni Brown, so it looks really dark but has a brown nuance. We'll soon show you also a lot of different other colors. Headlamps start with LED already with this four dot structure, optional a dynamic LED package and then optional optional. The matrix LED also for more high beam range. 4 meters 92, 16 foot 1 or 194 inches is the length both the Cayenne Coupe and the Cayenne SUV. That's no difference, but the main difference is the roofline is two centimeters flatter and especially goes down here in the rear area. And that makes this coupe look. It has this fixed wing right there and of course this window graphic right there. Also, about extra price of 9,000 euros or dollars for the coupe if you compare it to the Cayenne SUV. Well, but you also get somewhat more extra equipment even for the base versions, for example, 20 inch wheels. However, those ones here are the optional 22-inch wheels in the Spider design. And you also get the PASM as standard. However, still the Coupe will be more expensive. And, of course, it's a very expensive car overall. Rest of the design is rather conservative and round shape, right? There are not too many dramatic design lines here with the turbo. Of course, in the rear, the turbo will be more dramatic with those tailpipes coming up very soon. So what do you think here about this Coupe roofline? And this is, of course, the second big difference, SUV and Coupe, here with a different window line right there. Because it creates less drag, you also need a separated wing then. It folds up when you get as true speed over 90 kilometers an hour, and then it goes up or down 13.5 centimeters again. Oh, and by the way, if you see it going up here now, this is a so-called cleaning position. It does not go all the way up. It could possibly going be up because it only goes all the way up when you're driving really really fast. Then the Cayenne Turbo of course has some more sporty features like those quad exhaust pipes and they are real ones not fake. We've seen a lot of fake exhaust pipes recently here not in this case and then this typical new Porsche design where this light strip goes all around the vehicle and also just dimension wise this coupe here is always two centimeters wider also than the SUV, so it has a little bit more stance on the road. And now, first of all, a lava orange vehicle. Yeah, I think it's a matter of taste as for the color. <laughs> what do you think? But I really want to talk about the sports lightweight package because this is installed here on this very vehicle. Let's take a look at the details. It starts with those 22 inch wheels. Different designs are available. This is in the biggest size. Then a carbon fiber roof. It does save some weight, yes, but I mean, considering it's still a two tons vehicle, I'm not really sure if that's really a key factor to save a couple of kilograms of weight. It's just more for the visual part, of course. And comes together with an Alcantara ceiling from the inside. Very beautifully done, sporty atmosphere. But the downside is then you do not have the glass roof, so you cannot see through. And also the whole interior is a little bit darker. But what is brighter are those seats here with the fabric on the inside. Also belongs to this sports lightweight package. And this one will of course be my say, favorite seating option. It stays cooler in summer and also warmer in winter times. And also has this special old school style structure. And my second favorite, this Alcantara steering wheel has a good grip in all situations. Feels cozy and sporty at the same time. Really love it. And last but not least, how those fabric seats look in the rear compartment. Here you can also see this split in the middle part. So this is this two single seat option where it would not be that cozy to sit then in the middle part. And you know here in our longer auto fuel video, we really go in detail and also explain you some background information. And one very interesting one is the discussion about the overall weight of the vehicle and which one is sportier. 
the Cayenne SUV or the Cayenne Coupe. Well, here the Cayenne Coupe it is actually a little bit heavier because this central roof there, which you standardly get with the glass roof, or then with the carbon fiber roof, which we have on this one here with the sports lightweight package. But in both cases, the roof is set in. It's not, you know, belonging to the whole hull structure of the whole vehicle, maybe a little bit, but not in a way as the normal fixed roof would also contribute to the overall chassis stiffness. So in the coupe, they have to make some parts around the vehicle a little bit stiffer and therefore also a little bit heavier. So the coupe itself has, let's say, you know, not the optimum building form to be sportier than the SUV. Therefore, it would also be a little bit slower, just a tiny notch. That's also reason because they didn't want to accept that at Porsche because when the coupe looks sportier, it's also supposed to drive sportier. Therefore, they put the sports chrono package from standard equipment here with the coupe that evens out the difference when the other one does not have it. And then they also offer this sports lightweight package with the carbon fiber roof, those special uh, wheels which are also on this vehicle here. They reduce also again some more weight. So the overall weight increase of about like 30, 40 kilograms can be then reduced again to 20 to 30 kilograms. And then you're almost even again and can say it's not less sporty. But, you know, we recently had it also with the A7 versus the A6 sedan at Audi. The sportier building form from the visual aspect does not necessarily mean it's the sportier car. That's a very interesting aspect. But also interesting that they had a lot of effort to even out this difference then once again. Hope you enjoyed also this very special insight. And here you can see the optional carbon ceramic brake now together with the lightweight sports package wheel the special one see how massive they are and also this special carbon ceramic structure again if you're not having a track use you do not have to go for them and of course the extra price is extremely high so uh, other people buy a whole car for that extra price and since they have this special coating as for example standard for the turbo or option for the other cars it's also quite good for the brake dust because it keeps your wheels clean. That would be one advantage of those carbon ceramic brakes. And of course, this one ha have even less fading effect, but that would again be more racetrack um, relevant and not really for normal road use. And some more color variation for you with a pure white car. This always somehow fits to a Porsche, I think at least. Also the coupe, especially now with this round line, works pretty well in white, or what do you think? Or what about this chalk white color we had already in the Panamera, for example? Would that work for you? So what I have to say is that especially here to the chalk white exterior, those gray fabric seats, they work especially well. So this is a good color combination then. Or a real black car without this brown Margoni tone in there. Or a little bit brighter in silver. And we have even more for you. Here you really have to look close. This is this midnight blue, a very dark blue tone. And they have a lot of colors where you cannot really differentiate between black, dark brown or dark blue. So you really have to look up close. At least you with the gray, you can really see it's a gray car. And that's the color tour for today. And to show you the lighting signature a little bit better, we have a car inside here. And then you can really see how this signature will play out at night, for example. Pretty impressive. And this one here is the Cayenne Turbo with the normal turbo exhaust, so without the special performance pack option. And I really have to say, in that way, it really looks more impressive than with this optional performance pack special exhaust, black inside, silver ring outside. This one here looks more impressive, doesn't it? What's your take on those? And now we're here with the direct comparison, the Cayenne SUV and the Cayenne Coupe. And you can see, this is really all about this roof line that is falling then right there. Which one is more beautiful to you? I would really like to see your reaction to that in the comments. This one here, by the way, both vehicles are the Cayenne Turbo, so you can really relate to that. And also interesting, both have the very same wheel design, this spider wheel design, but here with the Cayenne SUV, those ones here are 21 inch, and those ones are the biggest 22 inch. So I think 21 still works very well. Or what would be your take? And if we look again in detail, look the flatter A-pillar already and then the overall flatter roof. And also look at this window graphic right there. The window graphic is 
smaller, has less height than in the SUV. You can really see that now when we pan over because to the SUV, see the apron is a little bit higher, overall a little bit higher, two centimeters. And then especially look at this window graphic, which is again way higher in the SUV. So that also will make a difference looking from the inside to the outside, for example. And now the direct rear comparison with the Cayenne SUV and the Cayenne Coupe. You can see, of course, different window line right there. This is, of course, way longer here and also a little bit flatter than here. And also interesting, what else can you see? Well, look at the number plate. Here in the Cayenne SUV, it's placed right here. Whereas with the Coupe, it's placed in the lower bumper, which again also makes a visual lower appearance overall. And also interesting, that's you know more about the optional equipment. Here is the standard turbo exhaust, and this one then here is the optional performance exhaust. If you look at close, and yeah, as I said, uh, this one here definitely looks more spectacular, I think. But the performance exhaust is supposed to be even louder. Yeah, and the front perspective was missing both here again turbos. You can see the bigger air intakes in the lower area. Here, yeah, this very vehicle, by the way, also with the sensor and the front camera. But this is just about the extra equipment. It has nothing to do with the difference of SUV and coupe. Well, in a little bit, you can already see because this flatter roof line, you can see a little bit of that already from the front. And even more difference because with the little bit higher roof line, they also have the roof rails here at the Cayenne SUV. And that makes this, you know, difference a little bit more visual already from the front but everything that is just you know hood wise the very same styling and design so what's under the hood before we talk about this one let me give you the general overview general overview about the engines so for the coupe here the same as for the k and suv a three liter v6 single turbo with 340 horsepower six seconds is the acceleration figure that's the entry engine Based on that one, there will also be the plug-in hybrid. I can already announce it to you right now. So the same also for the Coupe. A very interesting one because we had about two liters less of consumption for the hybrid. Nine liters about the other engines, about 11 liters on one kilometer. Very interesting. And then there is the 2.9 liter V6 bi-turbo with 440 horsepower. Second, less in acceleration, about five seconds. And then... Ta-da! The one we have here right now, the 4-liter V8 turbo. So the turbo with the turbo. <laughs> you know those Porsche turbo names? They all have turbos meanwhile, but this one here still keeps it the turbo in the very name. 4-liter V8. Then here with 550 horsepower. And the acceleration figure here then is about 4 seconds to 1 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. And the rest of the technology highlights here for the Cayenne, well, you have an optional air suspension, of course, and also a rear axle steering, which is also equipped with the test vehicle we have here for you today. How will it play out? We'll tell you in the driving part very soon. the car key a little bit slimmer than we used to know it for the Cayenne but it's the same for the SUV and for the coupe keyless entry is also available put your hand right there to close it or inside to open it this car is also equipped with the option of the soft close ah, magic well you can live without it for sure then inside of the doors everything is wrapped tightly as we know from the Porsche design here we got some aluminum, brushed aluminum inserts. Also reasonable space at the inside of the doors. And what I like with this platform, here we got the KN Turbo entry badge. You can see this even entry sill from the entry badge to the floor mat. Same for the platform brothers, the Volkswagen Touareg and the Audi Q7 and the Q8 
and it's just a nice entry to the vehicle. This one here has done the animal skin seat, usually standard for the Cayenne, but I've shown you earlier there's also this fabric option, special for the coupe, inside this sports lightweight package. And when there will later be a GTS version, there will also be some Alcantara at the insert of the seats if you prefer that. The rest of the interior, sport in here in a rather dark way, as we know from a lot of different Porsches. The steering wheel has a lot of controls indeed, and also this performance knob for the driving modes on the right side. We will experience more of that when we drive the car very soon. I would say, let me get a test inside in the front, because that one is just the same as in the SUV. You have a lot of space. I mean, it's a big vehicle. You have also this um, option when you close the door that the seat is going to the front again. Yes, quite a lot of space here. You have this glass roof in this case. Still some headroom right there. 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1. Should you not have subscribed the info? Well, if you have the other roof with the carbon fiber, then of course you have a little bit more headroom, but this is still okay. It will be more interesting how it will play out for the rear. Other than that, electric control for the steering wheel, up and down, also in and out. And I think it's also nice to have it in this way than here with this small knob that's a little bit nicer in a tactile way than before with other Porsches where you had this central control below the steering wheel. It felt a little bit weird, a little bit better right here. And you also have those new turning indicators. They are better just also from the, you know, from, just from the haptical feeling. That's really interesting. The old turning indicators, for example, in the previous generation or previous 911 and so on, they were also making strange sounds, especially when they were propping back here now with a better solution. But you can see, still a classic Porsche solution here with turning the car on on the left-hand side of the steering wheel. But you don't put the key in. This is like, you know, a key style, but to turn... Hmm, I'm not sure. Maybe it would be time then also for a start-stop button. Well, what's your take on that? Interior overview. Again, the Porsche design scheme with wrapping stuff tight. Sports chrono package here with the analog clock. Then a big 12.3-inch screen as a central control unit. However, climate control and stuff is still separate. On the left side, you have the classic analog gauge. Sumo deals to that. And left and right 7-inch screens. This is the basic overview. And... Those panic handles might be making sense, especially for the turbo, because then you can, you know, when you go a little bit faster, you can hold on tight to that. Now details to the infotainment system. Here, when you want to show off the car to your friends in the weekend, then press it once to put up the spoiler or hold it to put it back in. Also here, when you have the outdoor optional air suspension, you can put it to a terrain height. Pump it up, y'all. <laughs> Interesting, and it will also go automatically down to a lower position when you drive really fast on the motorway, for example. Phone connection via Bluetooth or via Apple CarPlay. Android Auto is not available for the Porsches yet. And then you can here go back to the normal Porsche menu. Let's also take a look at the GPS. Looks like this. Pretty clear display so you can also browse around it's a quite responsive system it gets really hot by the way the surface here gets really hot when it's warmer so um yeah almost a little bit unpleasant for the finger then and this would be the climate menu again you can control everything almost everything with the knobs below but here where the winds are coming from you have to do that in the screen so this is the infotainment system Sometimes a little bit complicated, maybe, but you get along with it a little bit better the more you controlled it. In the lower middle console, you still have a lot of control stuff, but for example, the GPS hotkey, you know, this is the home hotkey, but then the GPS hotkey is like right over there for NEF or like here. I'm not sure if I, you know, why should I do that as a driver? And Jumping to the GPS, this is one thing I really use quite a lot as a driver. I'm not sure whether I put it that way. There's a volume jog still behind the shifting lever. Other than that, it's more like inlet in this console. Here's the temperature knob. That one is still available, also with this nice metal knurling around. And then you have seat heating, seat cooling even available, and suspension settings also in the lower part, for example. And they all give something of a feedback. 
you hear it and you feel it also just a little bit. Then if we go lower, we also have adaptive cup holders, they're quite good. And then a nice metal knurling also around this 12 volt power supply. The USB ports, I'll soon show you, they're just under this armrest. One detail I really like is this rear mirror because it's frameless, and therefore it's quite elegant. Instruments, the middle part is analog, left and right side digital, and for example, you have a map view on the right side, also comes automatically when you head to the next intersection. Also night driving assistant is optional available. Then you can also check from lap force or G force in there, consumption meter of course, and also the situation of the car, all wheel drive distribution and so on, so you're quite flexible there to, for the information to be shown. That's the advantage of those digital elements then. A nice option is the head-up display, meanwhile available for all Cayenne versions. It's, by the way, perfectly sharp, just on camera, it's really hard to catch it. You have a standard view, but you can also switch it to a sport chrono view. That's very funny, isn't it? You can slide the middle armrest forward and backward and shake test. It's very well attached. Then normal USB supplies, two actually to charge your phone or connect to the Apple CarPlay. And you put it right here. This is, by the way, looking like an inductive charging platform, but it is none. So here in this vehicle, as I said earlier, we have the glass roof that gives a lot of light in the interior, unlike the carbon fiber roof, which would be just all dark and black. But here, when it gets too hot, we also have this cover right there. It is, again, a fixed glass roof, so you cannot open it. That's the disadvantage. The advantage, then, however, is that you can have it over a wider area of the vehicle. And now it gets really exciting. Let's access the rear together. So, here we go. Oh, wait a minute. Let me first show you that. So, there we go. This is the rear seating. And there are two possibilities. This one here is the normal three-seater option for the rear. There's also this single-seater option for the rear. I've shown you that earlier in the other car. This one, of course, makes more sense. You're just more flexible that you can still transport a third person in the rear. So, and, well, the good thing about this platform here, Tour Rack, Q7, Q8, and the Cayenne is you always have a lot of leg room right there. There's no problem. So with four tall adults, there's no problem. Does the middle seat also work? We'll soon check that out. Well, and then the thing is about the coupe, we would expect that I get some problems here with the headroom, but that's actually not the case. So there's still some headroom right there. And I, I said earlier in the Cayenne SUV, and there I could actually put a fist over my head. That's not possible. Well, I can squeeze it. So you, you lose like this in headroom still if you compare it to the KN SUV. But why is it still possible here? Why is it, you know, somehow okay from the headroom? They actually put the rear bench three centimeters lower here in the KN Coupe. And so you can still sit here quite well. This is actually the secret. And is it less comfortable from the seating then? Not necessarily, maybe a little bit, because I think this bench here, if you compare it here, the coupe versus the SUV, this one here goes a little bit more backward. I think in the SUV you sit a little bit, yeah, a little bit higher and more upright. So that's the catch. I think you can still live with that. It's still decent in comfort, but indeed, I think I just felt a little bit more comfortable in the Cayenne SUV. Again, it was good for the comparison because we've been shuttled here to this location in a Cayenne SUV in the rear. Never, we can also very well compare. By the way, you can also change here the angle of the rear seat. So you can make it a little bit more upright or a little bit more backward for a sleeping like position. And this will also be the way to flip the seat completely from this area. So that's possible. You cannot vary it in length. <laughs> we had some visitors right there. What else? We have some outside isofix on the outside seats. Then we have cup holders which are not adaptive. You can put this middle head restraint up if you like. Well, can I sit here on the middle part? Of course, there's this big all-wheel drive tunnel, so I have to put my feet next to it. And this is actually quite okay. Of course, it gets a little bit close in here with the head, but 
yeah, I mean, for shorter trips or so, it's okay. So you can also use this car with four adults. And last but not least, and we have to turn on the power for that, because here in the rear we own, we have two more USB supplies, another 12 volt power supply, and then there's a separate climate unit, if you want also with seat cooling and seat heating. Oh, and an interesting feature, by the way, it's also an option, are those shades for the rear passengers, electronic. They can only be controlled when the engine is literally running, by the way. Hey, there we go. Shade up, shade down, shade up, shade down. <laughs> so, what about the trunk right here? Let's open it. And this is 625 liters up to 1540. That's 150 liters less than with the Cayenne SUV. Of course, the biggest limitation is the height right here, but I think, you know, you can still live with that. I can also show you that here with the backpack. Well, you have to put here. Here it would not be possible. Here then it's okay also, you know, to fit it with this cover right there. So you can still live with it. Of course, you lose some height if you compare it to the original KN version. I can also show that in the measurements, because here the lowest position would be about 40 centimeters. That's still somewhat okay. And here then you get a little bit higher to the cover of about 50 centimeters. In length, the normal length here, it's just about a meter and also in width a little bit more than a meter. You can also lift this one right here. You can see the replacement tire would also fit. Here, if you have the air suspension, you can also lower the vehicle a little bit to easy the loading. And on the left side, by the way, there's also, surprise, 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 CD changer. Hmm, very interesting. Haven't seen that recently in the trunk of the vehicle, but you know, where else I want to put it. 12 volt power supply is also available right here, by the way. And now, well, to flip the seats, I really have to go around and use those levers I've shown you earlier, then push them down. Well, it, you know, always takes some time and I have to go to, around to the other side. And here we go. So, and that's now, let me just access it here. And when the seat would be as I would be driving, as tall person, this one is here on the maximum setup of 1,540 liters. So here we go. Let's into my driver's seat about 1 meters and 80 in length. You might ask yourself, why is this liter figure from those coupe versions and you know the high versions, why don't they differ them more? Because the leader figures are actually really measured not up till the, the top roof of the vehicle, but just under the closed cover. And that's the reason why those coupe versions, for example, or other sportier versions of the same vehicle don't vary that much in a leader figure. But if you, of course, load it up to the ceiling, then the original you know, hatch or SUV versions are, of course, a little bit better even in the luggage performance. You know, yeah, what do you lose overall with a Cayenne Coupe here? Not too much, of course, it's a little bit less practical, but I think, you know, in a region where you can still say you can easily live with that. And for a direct interior comparison, this one here is the Cayenne SUV in the front without any special roof, just a normal roof, and that leaves plenty of headroom right here in the front. Then again here, our Cayenne Coupe. A little bit less, definitely, because, you know, overall flatter roof and also with a glass roof. The glass roof has in the front even a little bit less headroom than the carbon roof because this one here has this shade and therefore they need to drop a little bit in height because you can apply the shade. But still, you know, somewhat reasonable also for taller people will fit in the front. And here again, the Cayenne SUV. First of all, you can slide the bench forward and backward. That's very important, maybe for you. And then headroom again with no panoramic roof. This one here has plenty of headroom. And I definitely sit higher. In the legroom, there's no difference actually. That's totally the same. But you know, you sit a little bit higher, it's a little bit more comfortable, I think. And here again, Cayenne Coupe with the glass roof. And you see, it's definitely closer here with the headroom but still fits with 1.86 or 6 foot 1 
And then, yeah, because the bench is a little bit lower and it falls a little bit more backward, you feel a little bit more, you know, it's a little bit less comfortable, I think, from a seating position, but still, you know, decent comfort overall, just if you take the direct comparison. And you cannot slide the bench forward and backward because they put it a little bit lower, then it doesn't exactly fit with the mechanism to slide it back and forth they had in the SUV. Short agile performance part and we go to Sport Plus here to show you the launch control. It's a little bit uphill and by the way there's more than 50 loud here so that's just what the system showing at the moment. Let's go. more than 100 kilometers an hour and did you see how the car was like like a spaceship and that was uphill so yeah that's the difference you have when you have the turbo wow hardly ever felt such an acceleration in an SUV and again a little bit uphill really crazy that is really crazy Soon we can also get to the normal driving part to search for more everyday driving situations. Here again we have some more nice corners for you and that shows how the steering is set up in a very natural way. Really gives a good feeling, makes this car a little bit smaller as for the feeling. Beautiful also with the fork, road a little bit wet and I mean even in, at those wet conditions the launch control worked pretty well so it reduces also the slip and together with this rear axis steering that works very well especially at those lower speeds the car gives a very nice agile handling and here also driving uphill all the time there's no lag or no delay whatsoever from the acceleration you immediately have everything you can possibly get as for the power. Wow. Thomas's driving lounge with the Porsche Cayenne Turbo Coupe with the Porsche Cayenne Coupe Turbo. However you want to take it, of course you can somewhat start it silently, but the turbo will always be a little bit louder. Then again we have this performance exhaust right there. Here's another one in lava orange coming towards us. But with this turbo, you know, you always have the sport mode, sports plus mode. And if it would be even right now, Next to the old lady, I would press the throttle and maybe cause a heart attack, but I won't do that. <laughs> but you know, that's the thing of this car. Here, when I'm in a neighborhood, you can leave it in a normal driving mode and be somewhat silent, that's still okay. As soon as you get out of the village, then you can let it fly a little bit more. There's also this rear axle steering built in here, and that means I have more agility when I'm driving at slower speed because then the rear axle is going across so that it reduces the turning circle for example really helpful at higher speeds the rear axle goes or the rear wheels go in the same direction as the front wheels to increase the stability especially when you park in and out and stuff it's a really useful option this vehicle is also equipped with the air suspension together with 22 inch wheels as long as the road is good that's really fine also the air suspension evens out the effect of stiff big wheels however if you want a little bit more comfort you would stick with smaller wheels and of course you have a little bit more tire buffer and then together with the air suspension you have a quite nice ride so this car can also be comfortable you have this upright seating position and somewhat you know a normal big SUV seating position so you can compare it also to the sister models to the Volkswagen Touareg and also the Audi Q7, Audi Q8. Indeed all of those models feel somewhat similar. The Cayenne then has this sportier touch. That's also what the brand says and so they try to make it a little bit stiffer as for the suspension and of course they put even more power in it. So let's see when I'm going over 
this bridge now. It's actually quite okay from the comfort still. Again, the air suspension does a very good job. When Just when you have some bumps, then you feel those bigger rims. But that's, you know, something you can, you can still live with. Great that the steering is also very progressive. See here when I'm, for example, here now in the roundabout, I don't have to steer that much. So that gives you a very natural steering feeling. And again, you can, in most situations, keep both hands at the steering wheel. That's also very important. So although it's a heavy car, it always tells you, yeah, you can, know, you can go in the slalom and enjoy it a little bit more. So now we get outside the city. And again, I know how loud this exhaust is, so I'll wait until we pass those cyclists until they accelerate it out. So now we can go from 40 kilometers to 100 in the sports mode. Let's go. Well, that's all we need. <laughs> yeah, you're now also testing the brakes. Because now again, we are at slower speeds. And that's again, really what this car is about. Now again, silent, comfortable, upright seating position. And then you can soon go to the next extreme. And this is also the difference when you drive the turbo. Every Cayenne version you could possibly buy has good performance, has good acceleration. This one here then two seconds less in the acceleration figure from zero to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour than a base Cayenne would be. And this guy is really overtaking me when I'm, when I'm at 30 kilometers an hour here. Well, so I really try to keep with the speed limit, especially when you're driving such a vehicle, because the police, you know, is maybe paying a little bit more attention to that. I always see the speed that is allowed here, also in the head-up display, and then also in the left instruments. That's also pretty helpful, especially because the noise installation is really good. You don't have to raise your voice that much. Also, when you're at higher speeds, no problem. And yeah, that of course increases the danger of being caught on speed cameras when you're actually driving faster than you're expecting. So always check the speed. Again, it's a very silent vehicle when you let it roll. And when you're just listening to this very good noise dampening, then of course this loud exhaust when you really approach it. Again, you can do it right here with the driving modes, Sport or Sport Plus. The exhaust system goes on on the Sport mode, but you can also, for example, keep it in the normal driving mode and just activate the special exhaust node here. Then you can just enjoy a comfortable ride, but also tell the people on the outside, hello, I'm a big exhaust guy, I'm coming right now, <laughs> if you want that. The sport mode will also change how the RPMs go up, for example, from the whole driving characteristic in the Sport Plus mode will make it even a little bit more extreme. But at least that's what a Porsche engineer told me once, when you are in the Sport mode, the exhaust sounds better than in the Sport Plus, because best exhaust sound does not always mean that it's the best for the performance. And in the Sport Plus mode, they usually trim everything to the performance side, and not necessarily just for the sound experience. It's also a very interesting aspect. So those instruments here are a little bit blocked by the steering wheel as I have it in this position. It's even worse in the new 911. Here it's still okay, but they somehow had to find a compromise between keeping it in some of the old school style, the retro style, and offering those new digital gauges. So that's then where you end up with. Is it a difference driving the coupe and the SUV? Yeah, that was a good question initially. And now we can also accelerate it out again. And well, yeah, this kick down is more, it's not about any turbo lag or something, it's more about the gear shifting you do. You, know, you can also shift back the gears yourself. Here, for example, second gear now, 60 to 100. Then shift up yourself. That's, of course, a lot of fun. And then you're, of course, gone and no one else can follow you. This is really sports car performance alike, especially here with the turbo. And of course, this even harsher exhaust note, always braking for birds, watch out. This shifting pedal experience, by the way, is really nice because the feedback you get from the shifting pedal is really smooth and somehow crisp at the same time. I really like it, so they did a great job in giving a good feedback from that. Agile car is here. Well, we can also overtake. 
you shift down. Oh, that's really close here. So you see the car is somewhat, yeah, well, I'll do that right here. Yeah, that's the problem of the bigger SUV. Maybe a Macar would have fitted there better, but um, I don't want to scratch that paint here of the vehicle. <laughs> So, shifting back yourself is always a lot of fun, that's pretty cool. Stop sign. I think that after that, we have another chance to overtake. Here, by the way, driving in the Steiermark region today, and that's a special region in Austria. And they have some great pumpkin seed oil here. I really enjoy that always, you know, over a salad or something when I'm here. And of course, they have some beautiful wine yard landscape. That's also what the region is famous for. So very beautiful one and quite often also with a very nice weather. That's why the wine is growing here in, you know, in such a shape. So um, people always enjoy a very good wine here too. Now it's overtaking time. In this case, it's really good to have a powerful engine because then the overtaking process also goes quite quickly and we have it just done. That's pretty cool. Um, this acceleration is of course so seamless. The power is always right there, especially if you use the shifting pedals on your own and just shift back then yourself. Yeah, I mean, this is of course a difference to the base engines and also even to a 2.9 liter V6. But in most of the situations you might experience in your everyday driving life, it's really hard to use all this power. Maybe in Germany when you have like open space motorway or something, but most of the time you will be still somewhat limited and not be able to floor it all out. And of course also a normal petrol engine would be enough. You don't need the high, highest spec turbo actually. And also pricing wise, if you think about you know, when the base can starts at 75,000 euros and the turbo starts at 150. So what, you know, this extra power, this two seconds less in acceleration does not justify double, like double increase in price. That's just not fair for the customer. That's just the reason where they say, oh, you know, when you buy a turbo, you don't care about money anyway, so our profit margin can be higher. That's the, you know, how Porsche earns money. Best, perform best price performance, and that's also the best seller worldwide, will be just the entry level 3 liter V6 engine. And then again, back to the initial question, does it drive just the very same coupe and SUV? Mm, it's maybe li like the question between Audi A7 and Audi A6. Yeah, you know, it's more or less the same indeed. You feel maybe some slight nuances here and there because the chassis is a little bit different, but you really have to drive the cars after each other directly and then to feel a little bit of a difference. But driving wise, there would be no reason to go for this one and not for the SUV. So that's more or less the same indeed. I think, you know, it's not very low sonorous frequency. It also indeed has this, you know, high frequency turbo sound. Or well, what's your take on that? Goes down in 
even at about 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, really silent. So it, it's almost like standing still, noise insulation wise. We'll just make a U-turn. I'll see about its turning circle. And that's really because of the rear axle suspension quite okay. Now the camera system with a very good resolution here. Right there, fake drone view from above. Then the main rear view camera, especially here in this drone view from the side cameras, which are mounted at the side mirrors. Really good resolution. You can very well see where you're actually steering your vehicle. Oh, we can see that the wing is still up. So again, this rear axle steering, one of the best options that is available for this vehicle, I think, because it makes it so much more flexible and very well to use it in, in your everyday driving life. And you know, at some point we're in Austria today, so there are no autobahns where we could float out like 200 kilometers or something. Um, so we stay you know, at like mid-speed levels here, of course that's not the primary region for this turbo, but the acceleration was quite nice and also sound-wise. So, let's say goodbye from this today's driving part. With another acceleration here in the woods. You can enjoy the sound once more and this acceleration together with us. Oh, what do you think here about the Cayenne Turbo or the Cayenne Coupe or both Cayenne, Turbo Coupe, Cayenne, Coupe, Turbo. Which way would you actually name it? Which way around? And before we get to our final conclusion, what is the consumption conclusion for today? Well, of course, if you really hammer it, then it goes like way beyond, more like, you know, towards like 17, 18 liters or something. But if you want to drive this car more economically and just, you know, like steady motorway speed or so and not push really, then it, that's quite astonishing, scores the same consumption figure than the 3 liter V6 and the 2.9 liter V6 by turbo. So this one here with the turbo also as a like normal minimum consumption, normal driving, 11 liters on one kilometers, that's 21 mpg US or 26 mpg UK. That's somewhat okay and one reason for that is bigger displacement so then I can keep the car at a lower RPM and therefore also not that high consumption. And this V8 here also has a cylinder on demand technology that means when just going rather steady, not so much acceleration, actually half of the cylinders are being shut down. So it really runs on four cylinders only then and also interesting technology detail. It's not that like one side of the V is being shut down and the other one's running. It's like two, two each. So they still get like a harmonious distribution. So there's no extra rattling or vibrations or so. So they really keep it also still in a V way, but then a V4. So obviously it worked. And it shows again that more displacement does not necessarily mean more consumption. You just have more consumption when you use all the power that you have available here. And now to our conclusion for today with the Porsche Cayenne Coupe. In this case also the Porsche Cayenne Turbo Coupe. From the exterior, difference the Cayenne Coupe to the Cayenne SUV, as I've been naming that one throughout the day. No, it's more that you have here this more put-up 911 style, if you prefer that. Maybe you also prefer just the Cayenne SUV. My personal take would still be the SUV. Which one would yours actually be? Then on the interior, they're of course both similar and the practicability you lose here is still somewhat okay so they also had some effort like you know with putting the bench rear bench a little bit lower that you don't lose too much headroom or so so you can still really live with that have almost the same practicability of course the suv in this case will do even a little bit better driving wise they're also pretty equal it is still a big suv but it's also a sporty one and in this very segment here the porsche Cayenne still sets somewhat the benchmark of sporty riding with those 22 inch wheels, of course, you do lose comfort. The air suspension evens it out a little bit. 
But still, if you want more comfort, you would stick, for example, with those base 20-inch wheels. Or maybe 21 could also be an alternative as for that. And then, of course, the question is turbo or one of the lower specs. This one here has more punch, yes, but the other ones are already a little bit faster. You can actually get the same exhaust sound if you go for the same exhaust um, uh, option. So that's also possible with the lower spec version. My tip would be also price performance wise, just go with the base V6. This one is also totally sufficient in power. Here in the front, we can see a very strong styling with this single frame grille. And you'll also see that the SQ8 here has a wider frame around the grille. Here also, not only this very beautiful Misano red color, you can of course get different colors, but here there's also the additional black package, where you have the black accentuations here in a shiny black in the lower part and also around the grille. Headlamps start with LED as standard, also beautiful modern signature here you can see and the SQ8 optional then with matrix LED. The length of the Q8 is 5 meters, 16 foot 4 or 197 inches and the difference is just that the Q7 is about 5 centimeters or 2 inches longer. They both share the very same wheelbase, it's just that the Q7 has a longer overhang in the rear and then also the option of a third seating row. A really cool shot with both here, you know, parallel right in the side profile. You can see here the wheel arches, always in vehicle color for the sporty models. One small slight difference here, the SQ8 comes with 21 to 23 inch wheels. They come standard with an adaptive air suspension and also the rear axle steering is now included for both models. So five degrees in the opposite direction then the front wheels so that reduces the turning circle by about a meter of course also gives you more agility at lower speeds at higher speeds than the rear axle steers in the same direction up to 1.5 degrees and optional you can also get an anti roll or anti tilt control so the vehicle stays more upright and also a sports differential for the rear axle both here with an all-wheel drive setup that is rear wheel biased so you also have power to the front, but rather a standard quattro all-wheel drive. Very interesting. SQ8 has the sportier styling here with the falling line right here. And also a light strip that goes all the way over the vehicle. Very beautiful job. And again, the black accentuations also here in the lower part. Case for the auto fuel fake exhaust police. Well, it's not a pure fake exhaust because the air does go through, but it's definitely an outside beauty tip because the real exhaust is on the inside, but also the real one has four pipes. And we also have a special paint here for the SQ8 for you. This one is called Velvet Purple. It's an exclusive color, so you have to go over the exclusive program, but definitely, yeah, a very, very unique one. What do you think? I think, you know, in this very special color, the SQ8 gets more a little bit of Lambo style, doesn't it? And now the trunk comparison, we start with the SQ8. And the cool thing is really because it's not this classic SUV coupe, you just lose a little bit of the height right here. That's what you lose in comparison to the Q7. The liter figure here, around 600 liters in the capacity. So you can very well still use it. You can see it here. This is here like a, you know, a trunk splitter, but you can also remove it completely. That's possible. In the front, you can put this one here up just for some additional, you know, repair equipment and so on. And you can lower the vehicle here, air suspension wise, for example. And this cover right here is like this. It's actually very good rails here, also at the side. And then we have to go around to fold the seats because they work like this. And you know, that way it would be fixed, of course, here in the one third, two thirds split. And 
One cool feature is that here, this top cover here, where you don't use it manually, it's just going back and forth also electrically, automatically, really cool. You can see when I close the hatch right here, not yet, but as soon as it's closed, and well, you can't really see it, but if you really look closer, uh, there it is, there it is, <laughs> then it closes. So um, when I open it again, then you can see, there it is, and it it's drawn back. start with the interior overview here today because SQ7, SQ8 is just the same right here. Horizontal stress also in here with the vents. A lot of black piano local use. However, here the styling elements in carbon fiber available here for the S models. Quattro logo will be illuminated at night with the ambient lighting. That's a very beautiful thing, definitely. The screen setup is as this. 12.3 inch digital instruments. 10.1 inch central screen and 8.6 inch screen like this for temperature control but also for address input in combination to that soon more details to the screens steering wheel here with the perforation at the side flat bottom very good size for that shifting pedals here for the automatic gearbox and here you control for example the view for the digital instruments we will show you that and a manual volume knob this is really cool you know so easy to control straightforward design and even though you have a lot of touch controls here you will see it it is easily reachable here also to control the temperature and so on so for a touch solution it's one of the best ones i think then here in the lower middle console black start engine or start and stop engine button this is you know, also a sporty element and at the sides again the carbon fiber structure yeah, here again, this is collecting a lot of fingerprints and so on. We have adaptive cup holders. This is also then the car key with an S logo. And further down the middle console, this armrest here can be put up just a little bit and like this. And then you have USB-C connectors here now too, but also an inductive charging um, port. However, I rather use the cable. Apple CarPlay you can use with the cable, but also wireless android auto just with the cable audi does have one of the best virtual instruments here boom boom <laughs> and with the rpms that's of course of course very cool to see you can have the map in the middle path small or change the view to the map completely this is of course one of the big advantages then of these digital instruments because you are so flexible especially then with the map view and the head-up display with the current speed and assistance system information. And if you have a root set, for example, then you also see some GPS arrows. Now details to the screens right here. Good integration of the Apple CarPlay. And let's also listen to the optional 23 speaker B&O sound system. Wow. What a surround sound. Awesome. Reading very crystal clear. So, yeah. This is really very cool, one of the best systems on the market, I think. And then you can go back to this MMI, this is the main menu. You can also have this customizable main menu, but I think this one is just easier. And you can also adjust where you want to have that, or if you want to have, for example, when you want to have the Apple CarPlay here on the left side also, then you can also put it here, and then you have it here in a, you know, in a, in a fast access. So this is actually a nice solution or to the GPS, which has a good overview. And the CPU they use here for this um, infotainment system is also sufficient that it's you know very responsive. So that is actually very, very well done. In the car settings right here, you can have the drive select because the air suspension varies. For example, it goes down in dynamic mode or um, you can also you know, put it up a little bit. It also depends on the speed you're driving when you drive faster it automatically goes down, for example. Well, and then this upper and lower screen sometimes play together. It is standard here. You have the vents control, like this here, the vents, and then the temperature is right here. Or either slide it or click it. You can also use the voice command, however. Set temperature to 22 degrees. Let's see. Yeah, there it is. 
And then when you change it on the right side, for example, there's one trick to synchronize it. This is actually quite nice. Meanwhile, I think here, like this, you like this closing gesture, and then you have both sides synchronized again. So I think for, again, a touch-only solution, you can very well use that here. Why not? And then when you are in the GPS and want to have some address input, you can, again, either use the voice command or it switches then here in the lower part to a keyboard, either like this or especially while driving here, then, for example, you can uh, just write Berlin or so, and then it's reacting on the top part. Now let's take a look at the differences. First of all, the door closing sound here, SQ8. Wow, nice sound, although we have the frameless windows and sometimes there is not such a good door closing sound when there's frameless windows. This is, of course, an emotional feature, but great closing sound here. However, there's also the optional feature of the soft close. Ah, magic. Yeah, but the thing is when you have the soft close, then you also have this motor working against you when you, you know, suddenly open the door, for example. Then instead of the doors, straightforward design then Alcantara used at the inside of the doors nice job and these carbon fiber inserts you can very well use also these door pockets and then the front dashboard design as we said is similar SQ8 and SQ7 as for the seats here the dark design different colors available and in Euro for example you would start with the sport seat with separated head restraint that also features Alcantara on the inside we would recommend that this is an optional, the Super Sport Seat or the Sport Seat Plus, which has these integrated head restraint. This is a standard seat in the US. And sadly, this one only comes with animal skin spec, so they need some alternatives which are sportier and more sustainable in this case here. Other than that, the general seating comfort, general seating comfort <laughs> is quite good actually. And um, although the standard Sport Seat, if you are in a European market, would be a little bit more comfortable this one then a little bit stiffer um, just also from the surface so but still considering for a sport seat you still have a good long-term comfort one meter 86 or six foot one and it leaves plenty of headroom right here you also have a panoramic roof as an option then you would have less headroom but still it would be totally sufficient steering wheel control is electric right here and you can easily find a very nice seating position definitely already here in the SQ8. Now to the rear of the SQ8. You can see here again with the nice Alcantara design on the inside and in this case we also have the electric shade here for the rear windows but they are already tinted so this would be like a you know double darkening then. You see you have a lot of space in the rear. There's a big middle tunnel yes of course and then there's also this additional climate unit here in this case the four zone AC which is you know quite a nice comfort feature and this quilted structure here in the you know in the rear part as well but this is not comfortable you know when you have a lot of contrast stitching here with the uh, slick surfaces now let's get inside also very easy and you have plenty of legroom here left so and both cars share the same wheelbase so legroom is not really the issue um, yeah and very comfortable here more comfortable than in the big sedans or so on and although this is here the SUV Coupe there's still a lot of headroom left and this is also an advantage if you compare it to a BMW X6 or the Mercedes GLE because the Q8 is not such an SUV coupe as the other competitors for example. So and then you also have here can you adjust the inclination right there and also can move this bench forward and then you have a little, little bit longer trunk or backward again so very flexible and very comfortable. Here we are with the engines. So the SQ8 and the SQ7 were so far, at least in Europe, offered them with uh, turbo diesel. But now I decided to go back with the petrol engines again, looking at the whole worldwide market that the performance SUV is rather bought than also with a petrol engine. So what do we have here? Is a 4-liter V8 by turbo, cylinder on demand, mild hybrid, both inside for fuel economy, but for power output you have here 507 horsepower, 770 newton meters of torque, and the acceleration figure is 4.1 seconds to 1 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. 
If you compare, for example, an SQ8 to an RSQ8, is 0.3 seconds, is the RSQ8 faster and 100 horsepower more. But for that, you pay 25,000 euros more. Here, the SQ8, for example, 100,000 euros in Germany without extra equipment or $90,000 in the US. But of course, with these big Audi vehicles, usually you can easily add some 30K options to the base price. Welcome to Thomas's Active Driving Lounge with the Audi SQ8 versus SQ7. We start with the SQ8 here on the test track and let's just floor it out acceleration wise and do some dynamic driving. Let's go. Oh, that was already 160 kilometers an hour. Wow. That was spectacular. You could already you could see like how the car is lifting up in the front. Really cool. It's of course a heavy SUV, but still for such a heavy SUV, good driving dynamics. We have the EC Sport mode. Actually, we have the EC Off mode, have we? So here we're about 50 kilometers an hour and see in the slalom. And yeah, this again, look how precise it is steering wise. Incredible. We just exit here. Wow. That was pretty cool. So very precise from the steering wheel. Um, so there's no dead area here whatsoever. Every single command is being transported. Really amazing. The steering setup is yeah one of the best there is, not only for SUVs, but also for cars in general. Of course, here in these corners, when also when accelerating out, you feel it's a rear wheel bias from this all wheel drive. So uh, there's no understeering or something but you definitely do feel the weight of this vehicle. It is a big SUV, so you cannot compare really to sports cars, yes, but we also have this anti-tilt or anti-roll control in here. So considering it's a high-built car, you see it's hardly leaning at all. It stays really, really upright. And by the way, we can also um, see the difference here. Um, ESC Sport. That's you know the one step. So if we go to the slalom here in ESC Sport, let's see what the car is doing. So sometimes I feel that it's like there's some interfer in, uh, interference. Oh, one of these I got. <laughs> so when I put it completely off, so I hold it. That's of course just for you know racetrack purposes. Then I can do a little bit more with the vehicle, and it just feels a little bit more loose. And there you also hear some tire squeaking. So. Yeah, subtle difference, definitely, but interesting to experience it. And again, when I do some accelerating out of the corner here, like this. Yeah, very smooth, very nice also sound-wise. So really amazing what this big SUV can do here. Difference to the RSQ8. The RS RSQ8 was even more screaming from the exhaust. Hardware-wise, it's difference on the front axle, so the front axle is a little bit crisper on the RSQ8. Uh, the hardware components then suspension-wise, they are actually quite the same. Um, so, yeah, this one is not as stiff suspension-wise, so a little bit softer. So we have, you know, let's say a little bit um, smoother setup in comparison. So, but here, yeah, I mean. No matter what you want to do, it's very precise as we'll see this one of the key features here. So RSQ8, not worth 25,000 euros more, definitely not. This one is already coming very close. But if you want it even sportier, even a little bit crisper and stiffer, then the RSQ8 would be fine. However, both SQ8 and RSQ8 still deliver a good comfort. We're here in the sports or the dynamic, dynamic mode and still we have a good comfort feeling and even if you just drive it in the outdoor and the in the comfort mode and so on, here due to this optional anti-roll control, you see it's hardly shaking up. So even just in the comfort mode, it's very sporty. And at any time, you can just throw it out like this. Not so much sound feedback like in dynamic mode. Comparison here, dynamic mode. Yeah, I think that got quite clear. Um, also, the RPMs are turned up higher and so on, shifting characteristics. 
um, are being changed. So um, very impressive what they've done here with this big SUV. So, wow. <laughs> and now to some street driving of the SQ8. So more relaxed manner, but yeah, what is relaxed in this vehicle? Um, <laughs> it can be, of course, at any time. But of course, you can also, once again, at any time, tune it up. And you do not necessarily have to pick the drive mode. This is also a difference to the RSQ8, where you have the RS button at the steering wheel, which is quite cool, of course. But here, you have to use this drive select, which is sometimes a little bit hard to do while driving. Um, however, you can also use it just in the auto mode. And, you know, let's say, oh, you want to do like a fast acceleration now, like here, 40 to 80 or 40 to 100, which you can do. Then you just use the shifting lever and switch from D to S shifting mode. Then you already have the, um, you know, the transmission set up and then it also goes quicker or in third gear like this. that's already it so yeah that always works no problem and you can of course use the shifting pedals shift down and that's always very nice at the same time just go back to the D to the auto mode and then the engine can also be actually quite silent and we we'll also tell you something more about the fuel economy because this is also here with the Zinner deactivation and, uh, and the M half technology mild hybrid so because you won't be racing this car all the time, you do have the power on demand. We've shown you that on the race track, well, on the test track, but you know, probably that's not how you would use this car all the time, but also just for relaxed driving. And this is possible, again, with this great noise insulation, plus then this very sovereign ride when you have a big engine, but let it run at lower RPMs, it also feels pretty relaxing that's the thing you know so you, it's not necessary that it, you only have the sporty use of that interesting by the way that the tires here of the SQ8 are always bigger indeed not in the sense of wider but in the sense of higher so on the one hand we have the 23 inch wheels here mounted it's of course an option compared to the 22 inch we have on the SQ7 and you can also drive both cars with the same size but here then, still they, are the, they know they have more tire left, although we have the bigger alloy. And that's very interesting because on the one hand, this guy feels a little bit sportier, mainly due to the bigger wheels. On the other hand, because they're also higher, you then have again more dampening from the rubber, which again ensures the comfort you still have with the bigger alloys. A little bit complicated maybe, but also interesting. So. You know, designers mainly took that decision because they just want to have a, you know, a bigger look, a more, you know, substantial look for the Q8 in general and especially for the SQ8, whereas the Q7 or even the SQ7 is supposed to look a little bit more sporty, elegant still, you know, but I think that that really works. And I can just stress again with this air suspension here, you still have some comfort even though we have 23 inch wheels, which is very, very rare. Of course, you do feel, you know, some stuff on the ground and here, but it's still very, very, very okay. If you want more comfort, you would leave it with the base wheel size each, then you have even more, you know, tire dampening there from, from the rubber. Um, yeah, but of course, it's always a question of design versus comfort. And this sporty steering, is not only helping, well, sporty steering, but also just an everyday driving life because you can keep your hands on the steering wheel all the time, you don't have to grab around and so on. Parking in and out is also relatively easy, for example. And once again, when you don't hit the throttle, you hardly hear the engine. It's very well insulated from the whole vehicle. As for the visibility, by the way, still works very well with the Q8 so we also you know the visibility to the rear for example no problem at all then the cruise control you can activate here with a separate column next to the steering wheel and this is also the predictive cruise control so there's traffic sign recognition in there I also see it in the head-up display at the moment 60 kilometers an hour 
and also when I, for example, approach the next town or the next intersection or the next roundabout, the car will automatically decrease the speed so that fuel is saved and you don't have like, you know, unnecessary acceleration and then unnecessary braking once again. So the predictive cruise control is also working very well. Blind spot monitors also include right here. There's no autobahn situation here at the moment where we would have overtaking cars or something, but there will be a flashing light then here in the side mirrors. So the assistance systems, they work very well in this vehicle. And here also, I'm not braking at the moment. See if it's reducing to zero. Of course, I'm staying you know, alert that in case I could I did not press the brake at all and now I did not hit the accelerator. You can see it also works in traffic situations. Sensors working very well here. I'm not doing anything. It's not me. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> so here, yet again, very well done. Braking and accelerating also in traffic situations. All done by the adaptive cruise control. Now has realized we are inside a village reducing it to 50 kilometers an hour, traffic signs and recognition. Here reducing even more again due to the distance to the car in front of us. So, so far flawless assistance systems, very cool. And here on the left upper column then, you can also uh, activate the lane keeping assist, the more sophisticated one. And this would be a thing then, for example, on the motorway that you really kept in the lane. And now to our conclusion for today with the new Audi SQ8 and the Audi SQ7. Both for sure very attractive SUVs, both with a sporty styling. Of course here today with the black accentuations, that's just an option. You could also pick the black accentuations here on the Q7, on the SQ7. The difference is really just a little bit overhang, a little bit more practicability for the Q7 and the option for the third seating row. Of course, here with the SQ8, a little sportier style, especially than in this rear part. So I think it's more a you know design versus practicability decision. Which one would I take? Hmm. Well, you know, this Q8 styling here is done in a way that it doesn't limit the back so much. So I personally probably would stick with the sportier design because I do not need the third seating row. But it might be different for other ones. So I think... Um, the design here, very sporty for an SUV, so is the driving. Really unexpected driving dynamics for such a big and heavy car. This is really very well done, especially the very precise steering. And if you compare it, for example, to the RSQ8, which we also have a video of, a very interesting one with beautiful landscape and great driving. You should check that out. We'll also link that video. This one here, 25,000 euros or dollars cheaper just for 0.3 seconds in the acceleration it is slower than the RSQ8 so this is definitely a better price performance ratio. The interior is with a high build quality and also very well to control. Yes you also have a lot of touchscreen control but it is very well executed and the menu structure is really simple so I think very well to control and the offering of space is good as well. That then again a little bit better in the Q7 or here the SQ7 and that they went for the petrol engines again. Yeah, I mean, you can understand that worldwide it just made more sense and it really more fits to these, you know, to these performance cars. The only thing that is missing is an animal skin replacement for, especially for the US market. In Europe, we at least can get some Alcantara on the seats. Of course, you would need world, but also sportier seats and also some that are a little bit more sustainable. Other than that, this is for a sporty SUV almost perfection in the execution. And now the conclusion of this SUV Coupe comparison. Design-wise, a verdict is always a matter of taste. However, we can say that Audi took the most progressive approach with the design of their Q8. They also show the most angular design, whereas the Porsche Cayenne has the most consistent design over the generations, still with predominantly round shapes. The BMW X6 and the Mercedes GLE Coupe are somewhat in the middle between that design-wise. So which one turns most heads? Definitely the Audi SQ8 and then the GLE Coupe with that strong AMG grille. But which one is the most beautiful one? 
Well, that's up to you. My personal favorite in exterior styling, I really like the extraordinary approach of the Q8 or the SQ8 and would take that design as a first impulse. But when I think long term, I think the BMW X6 would be a more timeless choice. So that would be my pick for the exterior design. As for the interior, the build quality is top notch with all these cars, whereas BMW especially stepped up the game in comparison to the predecessor. You could argue that they are even starting to get ahead of the competitors. Infotainment wise, Mercedes and BMW offer the best voice recognition system. Audi and Porsche set all sales on touchscreen, whereas BMW and Mercedes also offer a drive controller, a better redundant solution for controlling the infotainment system while driving. However, the software of the Cayenne and the GLE are more complicated. The software of the SQ8 and the X6 offer a better overview and navigation through the menus. Purely software-wise, Audi has the best intuitive solution. As for comfort in seating, the Porsche Cayenne has a disadvantage because of the stiff bolstering. However, you can make up for that a little with the sports design package which introduces the retro fabric seats. The Mercedes GLE and the BMW X6 are both very comfortable. As for the Audi SQ8, you should consider the proper seat form. Take the normal sports seat if you want to have it cozier and not the S sports seats. However, they are for example standard in the US and also some other markets. In Germany there would be an option. As for harm to animals and the environment, with this one exception in the sports design package, Porsche widely ignores this issue for the seating materials besides their new Taycan. Audi offers a fabric based trim in some markets, but not in the high spec models. BMW offers SensorTech leatherette in all markets for almost all cars, but not for the X6. Hmm. In this segment, Mercedes leads the way with their Artigo or MBTEX high grade leatherette, as well as a Dynamica microfiber mix you can get in most markets. Driving wise, the Porsche Cayenne and the GLE 53 AMG have the stiffest setup suspension wise. The air suspension of the BMW X6 is also relatively stiff for a big SUV. However, you can also easily stick with the normal adaptive suspension by BMW and it will do a good job. The Audi SQ8 shows the best compromise in driving, is the best to combine comfort and sportiness. The GLE 53 AMG shows the biggest difference between the sport model and their normal model. The most driving fun I had with the BMW X6. So from stiff to comfortable I would rate GLE 53, Cayenne, X6, SQ8. Engine wise only the GLE 53 AMG comes with a 6 cylinder, all others take the 8 cylinder approach. So the GLE 53 Coupe is the slowest in acceleration. The 8 cylinder SUVs are over a second quicker from 0 to 100 km or 62 miles an hour. X6, Cayenne and SQ8 only take about 4 seconds for that sprint. As for fuel economy, well they are all pretty bad in that. Best choice here would be the BMW 6 cylinder from the X6 40i, so stepping down, if you want a more economical alternative. And Mercedes and Porsche do offer plug-in hybrids for the SUV coupes. Porsche even in a performance version. So now where does that leave us? That's a really tough pick for today. All four master certain disciplines the best. The Porsche comes with the sleek design of a put-up 911 and the very sporty handling and abundance of power. The retro fabric seats in the sport design package are pretty unique. However, the Cayenne is suspension-wise, together with the GLE 53 AMG, also the least comfortable one in this test. The Mercedes GLE 53 AMG Coupe is way stiffer than the non-AMG versions. It offers the best natural voice input with the MBUX infotainment system. The GLE offers high-grade leatherette seating and in a lot of markets a nice microfiber article mix. The Audi SQ8 shows the best compromise between sportiness and comfort. The driving is just flawless. As for the interior, the user interface is touch only and very intuitive. Especially in high trims, Audi uses a lot of animals for the car. The BMW X6 has the most natural driving feeling without being too stiff. The adaptive suspension is so good that you don't have to pick an air suspension even. One flaw of the X6 is that it has limited legroom in the rear for a car of that size. Voice input is very good. 
The material quality is great, however they do not offer Sensatec from works for the X6. Maybe it is possible to make an individual order. So my verdict, SQ8 most striking on the outside, however I found the overall timeless and sporty elegant style of the X6 more pleasing long term. User interface is voice wise the best with Mercedes and BMW, touch and menu structure wise best with Audi. Seating comfort is the best with BMW and Mercedes, seating material wise Mercedes leads it. The driving fun, well surely in all of the cars no doubt. The Audi SQ8 is a great all rounder, the X6 has the most natural driving feeling, GLE 53 and Cayenne are feeling the sportiest and stiffest. So for me if the dealer could get me an annual free seat for the X6, I'd be on board with the BMW X6 M50i. What would be your pick and why? Tell us in the comments.